to start out with some updates from DCF, it's sort of uh, sort of the boilerplate information that we um, would like to have, and we'll invite Christine Johnson and Ken Schatz. Are you going to you're going to come up? We'll do together. that together, if that's okay. So sure, you know everybody here, right? Yes. Okay. So, so why don't we let you provide information, and you have given us a handout. Is it this one? There's three handouts. So okay. it starts with Tom Ken Schatz, the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Um, and with me is Christine Johnson, who's the Deputy Commissioner for the Family Services Division. We do appreciate the opportunity, let me just say, to have your committee ask us for updates. From my perspective, it is helpful to keep you informed about things that are going on of significance and also to be available for questions so that we can address issues that are on your mind that we might not have anticipated. So what we had in mind for today, uh, first of all, Christine is going to, going to be the, the, the spokesperson. She's much more uh, knowledgeable and adept than me at the details. But we provided you with three handouts. One was the Child Protection Report, um, which is, okay. as you may know, required by statute that we produce annually uh, to provide you information about um, the calls to our hotline and our responses to that with respect to abuse and neglect. We'll also give you an update regarding our caseload, and that's the, the, the uh, longer sheet. As some of you may recall, we've done this on a, oh, a okay. semi-regular basis in the past to give you a sense of the actual trends of the different kind of cases that come into uh, the child welfare system and, frankly, our workload issues and challenges. The, the third piece that um, we will talk about is there was a recent review by the federal government um, with respect to our um, national um, youth uh, tr uh, in transition database. So basically, we do have work that we do with uh, youth aging out of the system and how successful we are in terms of enabling them to be successful members of our community. And so uh, Christine will also talk to you a little bit about that review and things we learned from it. So that's the, the overall uh, thought that we have. And so I'll turn it over to Christine and glad to answer questions as they come up. I appreciate the light, too. That's a big light. That's great. Yeah. We, were, we, were, we didn't want to fall asleep. We didn't want anybody to fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. Great. Terrific. Thank you, thank you well, Christine. I'll go ahead and jump in because uh, I may have put you to sleep had we, you know, talking about no, you won't. data without the lights. So I appreciate that, especially on this dark day. Um, so if you um, take a look at the, the color, the spreadsheet in color uh, can really give you a sense. Um, these numbers do um, date back to August 1st, and so we expect to have those numbers updated in October. We can certainly come back and talk about those numbers then. Um, but just really briefly, and then I'll allow you to ask um, some specific questions. Um, as of August 1st, we had 1,328 kids in the custody of DCF. We had 705 that were conditional custody orders, and what that means is that uh, a judge has ordered a child to live with a family member, a relative, or somebody that is known to the family. Um, and then we had 516 cases that are called family support cases, and those are cases that um, rise at a risk level of high um, and so the, the thinking is that if we open a case that can support the family and help provide them with some resources and services that they would then um, be able to um, essentially be a light touch on our system and not have to come in the door of custody and mm -hmm. potentially avert having um, the legal and the court involvement. Um, so we are um, um, sitting at 1,328 and um, let me, let me stop there before I go into some of our staff vacancies and hiring updates and just ask if you have any specific questions regarding caseload. So this is a point in time that we're looking at? Yes, that's correct. And if we were to look at um, this over time, what would the 1328 look like? So I can maybe help with that. We do have, and we can provide you if you're interested with um, information over time. So as some of you may recall, we basically back in June of 2014, we were about at 1,000 children in DCF custody. That jumped by 2016 to almost 1,400. Since 2016, we've remained stable at around 1330. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so the good news in, in part is that that number has not continued to increase. Again, we've talked a lot in the past that the opioid epidemic mm -hmm. has been a major driver of more children coming into DCF custody. And again, the state, as you know, has done a lot to try to address that issue. But in terms of our custody numbers, that has remained um, steady. But one of the things that is worth noting, and, and Christine may talk more about it, is we also have seen some increases in children who we support or supervise and families that we support in terms of two particular areas, conditional custody orders, which is when the court gets involved and doesn't put the child into state custody, but says the court is going to impose some conditions and wants DCF to supervise those conditions. That has jumped from approximately four, just under 400 in June of 2014 to now we have 705 children under um, conditional custody orders. That's a significant challenge for us. The other thing is um, with respect to youthful offenders, which is an initiative, and, and we've talked about that in the past, that is important with respect to recognizing emerging adults and wanting to address their needs in a more appropriate manner, but that number has also substantially increased our caseload uh, because of arguably its newness, and uh, and so we're seeing substantial increases in the in the number of youth on probation. So let me stop there. I have a question. Um, in regards to um, areas of the state, the different districts, are there any um, district areas within the last, you know, during 2019 where there's been a significant change where you would have any concern or, you know, the, the numbers have kind of escalated more than, you know, they might normally? So I think that, 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 sure, I think that, that you know, the, the court puts out, and I don't know that we provided it this time, but we may have, Judge Grierson might have provided it last time. So there are, there is data from the court that is very helpful to look at the, map, uh, the number of filings of abuse and neglect petitions by, uh, by county. I think that, you know, we've talked a little bit in the past, particularly about Franklin County. Um, interestingly enough, their numbers actually went down in fiscal year 19, which is some, some good news. Okay. Overall, as I think you may recall from our last meeting, the numbers of abuse and neglect filings did go down uh, statewide in, in fiscal year 19. So, what, what, so, so that obviously is, is a trend that um, is, is helpful. What I would say is that there, to really respond to your question specifically, there's no area of the state that I'm aware of looking at this data that has a significant increase okay. in filings in fiscal year 19. That trend is, is, is down pretty much statewide. There's a couple of mine, you know, there's a case by case determination, but by and large, it is statewide, the reduction. Great. Well, let me just continue to um, talk a little bit about, um, I think also on the kind of the all cases, all open cases summary, it shows um, kind of our, our workload in terms of our family services workers. And so what I'd like to give you an update about is that we, of the 14 positions that were um, legislatively um, created last and last legislative session, we have hired nine of the 14 positions. So we have um, six new family services workers and three that have been hired and through three are under recruitment um, so we've hired one in at uh, in uh, st albans three in burlington one in rutland and one in morrisville and as i said the other three positions are under recruitment we have uh, three resource coordinator positions um, as part of that pool two have been hired one in rutland and one in the berry district and we're rec uh, recruiting them now in uh, brattleboro uh, one supervisor position in um, Bennington is under recruitment now, and our juvenile justice uh, attorney general, um, assistant attorney general position, uh, we have interviewed, and TJ Donovan is also interviewed, and so Ken will be interviewing this candidate shortly, and so we expect to have this person in place potentially in the next maybe 60 to, well, 40 to 60, 45 to 60 days, I think is reasonable. Um, so we do, um, you'll also see on the spreadsheet that we do um, apply a formula in terms of how many um, family services workers that we have. We have 178 total statewide. We have 50 that are dedicated to child safety investigations, 128 of whom are ongoing. Um, as of August 1st, and I, I suspect this has changed, we had 12 vacancies. And um, 
we apply a formula for those who are within their first six months of employment and undergoing training. Uh, we have uh, 15 um, that are in that category. And so the formula gives us a sense that we have 108 actual ongoing family social uh, service workers statewide. Our hope is that the new positions, the 14 new positions, are going to help us to um, reduce our caseload um, totals and really get us to a stable place where we can really focus on the retention. Um, I think we are doing a, a very good job of filling those positions. We have a very um, specific process that Sheila Dronelow in my office uh, shepherds. She knows where all the vacancies are and where all of the uh, positions are in terms of hiring and uh, really does a good job of, of managing those statewide so we have a really good pulse on, on how we get um, people in the door and hired to do this work. What's your caseload target? Our caseload target is 15 okay. and we know nationally the, the kind of the best practice is 12 right. so I would like to see us at 12. Um, but I think right now, uh, this data shows us at, at being, I want to say, um, what is it, is it's it 19? Yeah. Um, so it's 16.2, if and you 20, look at 20, it in 20, 20. bold right. numbers, that not counting vacancies um, or new employees, because again, we, but when we do the, the, the calculations that Christine is describing, uh, we do recognize that new employees can't handle a full caseload for a while, and so that's where you get the, the 22, uh, 22.8 is um, child family average for authorized worker, but, mm -hmm. and then it would get down to 19. So there are different ways of looking at this, and so historically you've asked us just for the broad number, and that's the 16.2 where we'd like to be at 15. Any other questions about the, the caseload before I move on to the? No, but thank you for putting in geographic and geographic mm -hmm. um, distribution. It's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, good. If we could um, switch over now to the 2018 Child Protection Report. Um, I'm just going to briefly give you a kind of an overview of what's contained in that report uh, that hopefully you'll find helpful. Um, we had uh, over 20,000, 20,779 reports of child abuse and neglect were made in 2018. This is pretty consistent um, over the last several years. It's 77% of those reports were from mandated reporters and 17% were from unmandated, unmandated reporters. Um, of those 20,000, we had 5,326 child safety investigations. Uh, 3,173 were actual investigations and 2,153 were assessments. So the 5,326 are about 25% of the total reports that were made. And that is pretty consistent over time. We had 1,281 cases that were opened for ongoing services in 2018. So of the 3,173 investigations, we resulted in just under 1,000 substantiations. We had 1,182 individual child victims. And that number is going up. That's the highest number we've seen in 14 years. We also had 1,036 incidents of abuse. So we talked about um, the numbers that we have in custody. I'm sorry. I was just wondering if, you, if um, I haven't looked through this whole thing, if it's broken down by gender and age. It, this in front of us is not, I don't believe, but we can get that to you. OK. OK, great. Yeah. Um, so the one thing I do want to point out though is that the reports of child abuse and neglect did decrease slightly from 2017. Um, I think we're down, I want to say about 400, just over 400 in terms of fewer um, reports from 2017. So I think that um, is potentially a good sign. Um, I also want to point out that the majority of our reports of a child abuse and neglect come from our educational system. Um, and you'll also notice, um, for the first time, this report has um, juvenile justice data, actually extends into uh, some of 2019 as well. Um, and you will notice that our youthful offender caseload has risen sharply. Um, and so we are working on getting a sense of, of what that is, you know, of course, with the law change in 2016, um, but trying to figure out how we've gone from 33 in uh, 2017 to um, 533 or 34 in 2018. Is there anything else kind of that you want to add data-wise? 
Well, just, I do want to just add the context, and you just touched on it, but just to say the reason you ask us to do this on an annual basis is to recognize that we do need to pay attention as a community to child abuse and neglect. And we obviously convey a message on a regular basis that if people believe a child is being abused or neglected, if they suspect it, they should call. That's what the hotline is about. It's really important. It has been of concern that the trajectory has been going up. On the other hand, we certainly don't want to dissuade people from making those phone calls. The fact that this year, as Christine pointed out, the numbers went down a little bit in terms of calls is, is certainly, uh, hopefully, a good sign. But at the same time, we do see increased numbers of victims. So the, the challenge, I think, for us as a community is to recognize uh, that abuse and neglect is a reality. And we want to address it to keep children safe. That's really what this report is all about, to sort of provide you with some data and information. At the same time, I can't resist making the plug for the um, CHINS work group recommendations in terms of prevention and early intervention to try to prevent this from happening, particularly through the home visiting approach. And, and we talked about that in our last meeting, but I think it's, to me it's directly related because we do, as a community, need to do our best uh, both to address those child safety situations, but also to prevent. So as you're collecting information and you're seeing a decrease, there's no way of knowing who's, who's safe out there. But um, are you, and you're, we're also putting in place the uh, home visiting programs. So are, is there data being collected from those programs which help us understand that there might have been, uh, a, there could have been a problem with this family, but it was prevented because. Is there any way to get at that? So or has we, that been put in place? It has not been put in place. The, the systematic approach had, with respect to focusing on outcomes related to prevention of abuse and neglect has not been put in place yet. We have an array, to be fair, of home visiting programs, which right. are, do excellent work, and they particularly focus on health outcomes. What the CHINS work group recommendation um, is asking is for an appropriation to allow us to start pilots of combining what's referred to as the Dolce model or embedding mm -hmm. family support workers that are not DCF workers, they're parent child center staff, in pediatric practices uh, to build on the successful public health approach of, of uh, the fact that 95% of, of infants um, who are, uh, go to within six months their well baby visits with pediatricians. We want to build on that and combine that with home visiting. So that is the proposal. You have not funded it uh, as of yet. As we talked about in the last meeting, um, we are going to be coming back to you to re ask for funding uh, in uh, the fiscal year 20 legislative session. But the, but the expansion of Dulce is taking place. I mean, there are three additional That's correct. sites. But that does not have a home visiting, an expanded home visiting okay. component attached to it. Okay. So that's where we okay. need, we'll be asking for your support for funding through the tobacco um, litigation money that you have put a fence around. Right. Uh, to, so it is available for pilots. Okay, good. So. <clears throat> then your sense is that that would make a difference within the Dulce sites. Yes, combining Dulce and an expanded home visiting capacity, mm -hmm. we do believe will make a very positive difference. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before Christine goes on? I mean, Deputy Commissioner, I'm sorry. No, you can call me Christine, that's fine. I certainly answer to that. All right. I, had, I have just a few updates I'd like to provide you, and, um, and then I think that'll wrap, round us out, um, so I don't know that we need all of our time. Um, I wanted to let you know that we just had a, a site visit from the federal government um, on our National Youth in Transition database that Ken mentioned. I want to point out that we had 51 stakeholders that were interviewed as part of this process. It is the highest that has been seen nationally, and we should be very proud of 51 stakeholders across the state, including 11 youth coming to be interviews, uh, interviewed and to offer their perspective and their experience. Um, and so I think that was definitely a key takeaway that I took from um, what I heard from our federal representatives. Um, 
I do want to point out, and I mentioned this last time, um, we have a very outdated um, what's called an SMISS system um, that is tracking our data across child welfare and child protection within DCF. Um, they did point out to us that that lack of a quality CWIS, what's called a, a child welfare information system, system um, is really impacting our ability to analyze and to also track and report data. So I just, I have to put in, um, kind of share with you what the, our federal partners um, see as well, in addition to our perspective that not having the, um, the, the updated technology is in a lot of ways um, impacting our ability to really understand what's happening in terms of outcomes. Um, just to give you a quick synopsis of what the National Youth and Transition Database is. Are we on a page somewhere here? No, or? I'm sorry, okay. this, these are just updates. I did okay. not provide any That's fine. additional materials. I just want to know. Um, yes, thank you. Um, in terms of um, what it is, it is a survey of um, our young people starting at age 17 and then a cohort at 19 and 21. And we are required to hit a certain percentage of our young people who have been in foster care to really have a sense of what is happening to them um, as they transition out and become adults um, in our state. And so um, we, um, we certainly will take the input that we get um, from our federal partners with ACF and turn it into a, a, a plan and, and moving forward and thinking about how we can um, survey and identify our young people as they do um, transition and then uh, are no longer connected to our system. But I just think it's a really important tool that we have that really gives us a sense of, of the outcomes that we're looking at with our young people and how we will use that data to inform then what we need to do in our foster care system. Um, I did just return um, last night from the National Judicial Leadership Summit on Child Welfare with Judge Gerson, um, two public defenders, and um, Rob Post uh, from the Court Improvement Project, and we had a very robust two days um, thinking through child welfare and the court system um, connected to the child protection system and, and how we can improve there. Um, one of the things that I really heard that I liked uh, very much is the concept that children exist in the context of their families. Mm -hmm. And so as I think about the conditional custody orders and how those numbers are increasing, I think that we are headed in the right direction because as a child protection system, what we want is children to live in their families. And we want them to do so safely, and we want to have the, the, the system and the resources that can support our youth and our families and our children in doing that. Um, so we had themes there um, that focused on um, key elements that I uh, think are integral to our system, and that is youth and family voice in both child protection, but also in our court system, and what that looks like. Uh, we talked a lot about high quality representation and what that can look like. And so I just want to relate to you that we have come back from this meeting with a robust list of, of I think, things that we can explore and continue to meet about as we think about how we, um, how we continue to optimize our <coughs> child welfare system. One of the things that was pointed out that I, that I think I would like to look into more, and I know we talked about this in the past, is, um, is a peer mentoring program. I, again, it was one of the recommendations of the Children's <coughs> Forum um, work group, but um, Washington State is now um, using what's called the, the Parent for Parent program, and they use parent allies, they have parent training, and they are just now implementing in King County, which is their 39th state, and so I think there's a lot that we can learn from a state like Washington, and uh, in fact, they've evaluated it through the National Council for Judges and Family Court Judges, and they are wrapping up an evaluation with the University of Nevada in December. So, so I, it, I mean, it, it, so this is this is a parent-to-parent -parent, uh, mentoring program that's strictly uh, related to custody issues, related to how would you frame what the mentoring encompasses? My sense of it, and I certainly would like to learn more, but my sense of it is that it is for, uh, for families who are working within the DCF system in, in a custody type of situation and, and learning and working with somebody who is supporting them as a peer mentor, somebody who's been in that system themselves. But not simply in the, the, those who have gone through a judicial process or so I, think, I think the idea is that mentors would typically be people who've gone through the process. So they have an understanding of how the process works and can help educate other people who are having to get involved with the child welfare system mm -hmm. how to, frankly, maneuver in it. Because it is a challenging, complicated system. There is no doubt about it. And, and I think that there, 
some of these models have been quite successful in recognizing that having peers to help somebody get through a really emotionally challenging time can be very helpful. So it's really a systems nav navigation. Is there support also about, uh, in addition to the uh, case, case manager, is there additional, is there help with that, with the, exactly how the family might modify itself to support the child? So I think the peer navigator model is not a system, is the idea is to separate it out, to recognize okay. that this is really a peer mentoring, as, as Christine described it. It's so it, not a case manager. Mm -hmm. It's not an official, I mean, we honestly have uh, our, our staff, the, the designated agencies have staff, parent-child centers have, so there's an array of different service providers, and it's part of the idea is the peer mm -hmm. mentor can help the parent figure out Mm -hmm. how to take advantage mm -hmm. successfully of those other services that are out there. So this okay. is more for parents and the family around the, um, the troubles? That's correct. It's the Al-Anon um, um, model. It is recognizing, again, as to support what Christine said, we recognize the family constellation is really important, and we want to try to preserve that or even reunify as much as possible when we can do so uh, consistent with child being safe. And I think it does make sense in our view to help support the parents. In my sense of um, what I heard there was that this is a, this is a kind of a, a peer to work and, and help, as you pointed out, navigate the system yes. and help to provide the services and the resources that helps connect yeah, those dots for parents. Does for, um, yeah. mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Great. Um, so you're going to continue and evaluate what's going on out Yes, there. I would like to learn more, and I have contact information to reach out, and I oh, would good. love to uh, get on the phone with Washington and find out more about what they're doing. You're going to Washington. Know. We're all going to go with you. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, duly noted. I, I will say. <laughs> no, I'm just I'll add kidding. it to my list. Um, just really quickly, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we are starting what we call our fall roadshow, so I am um, just finishing up year, uh, month four. Uh, with, in my new role as Deputy Commissioner, and we will be going out to all of our districts starting next week. We'll do two a week, and really get a chance to, to meet with staff. I've done some of that already informally, but this will be our formal um, ability to meet and really get to hear from our staff and, and, and hear their concerns and talk about what's going well in their district offices. We also are embarking upon community conversations in each of our districts, and so we can let you know the dates and times of those. But again, a chance to really engage with our, des our designated agencies and our community action agencies and our nonprofit uh, organizations as well, and really start thinking about um, the continuum that is child welfare that uh, DCF is a, a partner to. We are starting uh, next week, uh, Senator, in uh, both Brattleboro and Bennington will be our first up, um, so we expect to be there next, I think, Thursday. And also, what, what I'm reminded about with that process is that we developed a strategic plan over the past year, and so largely the conversation to uh, these district meetings will be to talk about where we are with the strategic plan, and so perhaps we should think about um, updating you about where we are with our strategic plan as well mm -hmm. in the future. And then uh, lastly, we have a juvenile justice stakeholder conference on Friday, so tomorrow. We, um, as you may know, have engaged with uh, the, the uh, Justice Lab out of Columbia University. And this will be a day-long uh, meeting with our judicial partners, defenders, uh, public defenders, state's attorneys, and, and uh, DCF staff to really talk through the planning efforts so far and where we're headed with with the Raise the Age and Act 201. So we're very much looking forward to this conversation tomorrow and um, hearing what our partners uh, in this, uh, in creating the system uh, have to say and, and kind of where we've, where we've landed so far, but really where we're, where we're headed. Some members of this group will be there. Great. Great. Some won't, but. Yeah. And, and at least one is an important part of the oh. process. Yes, I think yes. he's on the agenda. I think he is. He is. <laughs> I'm just a prop. We appreciate uh, your taking leadership on this issue, Senator, and I think it makes Rock. great sense that you have a role to play in this conference. We yes, appreciate that. Okay. Is that it? That's, I'm done. Wow. <laughs> well, sounds like a lot of work, seriously. Um, 
and the road trip that you're on, road trip you're on right now. And so can you talk a little bit about exactly what happens when you go out on the road and go to Bennington and Brattleboro or other Newport or Sure. Well, in my new role, really, it's it's getting out and meeting all of the staff that okay. work for Family Services, and we chose to have it be a specifically just a Family Services staff meeting as opposed to opening it up to our partners, which is why we're coming back and having more of the community okay. meetings, um, because I, I definitely value both. But this, for me, is really a chance to get out and meet all of the staff, talk about my vision for Family Services, um, as well as to um, speak about the, the implementation of the strategic plan and get staff input. So when you talk about not meeting with the partners, it's it, so who, who's excluded with, with that? Well, for example, we could have opened up the, the road shows to our economic services staff mm -hmm. and our other divisions, and we could have asked corrections to come and meet with us as well. Um, that will be more of the community conversation meeting, um, just because, again, being new in this role, I thought it was um, advantageous to really spend some time listening and, and hearing from our family services division staff. And I would add that I try to do that also as part of my role as, as commissioner, which is um, broader in terms of the different roles that the department plays. So uh, I try to also get around the state every year as much as I can. And it is important to try to meet uh, with both our staff, but also community um, partners, if you will. And so by way of example, uh, as you may know, on Tuesday, the governor did his capital for a day in Bennington. And so basically um, taking Part of that was relevant for me, so I used that opportunity not only to meet with our staff, all of our staff, but uh, also actually met with residential um, youth residential providers in Bennington. I actually did that with Senator Sears. We also participated in a, a presentation with all sorts of community providers regarding suicide prevention. I also met with the Center for Restorative Justice in Bennington, which does a tremendous amount of work both for our department and also for the Department of Corrections. So um, just an example of the, the kind of thing we do. You know, I recognize, and, and Christine does too, that you know, in terms of leadership being in Waterbury, it's really important. We have 12 district offices around the state. It is really important for us to get out and talk to people to hear their thoughts, their issues, their questions and concerns. We do our best to, to try to do that. I think it's great that you're you're doing that, making the rounds. Um, this might be a little bit of an unfair question, being only four months on the job, but you mentioned your vision, and I'm curious, looking at what you've seen thus far, um, what what you know, one or two kind of key areas that you feel this. Um, area needs to focus on or should be prioritized in the coming year, particularly for us legislators as we think about legislation in the coming session. Um, and, and maybe you both want to answer that, I don't know. Sure, I will take a stab at it. I mean, I, um, I came in to this job with really kind of th a three-legged stool, if you will. One was thinking about capacity for our staff and for our system and for our foster parents and thinking about where we are in the shadows of Lara Sobel's death and the two tragic youth uh, children deaths in 2014. Um, but thinking about how do we right the ship in our capacity because I want our division to be able to do the job of child protection well. And to do that, we have to have the time and the resources and the energy to really focus on meeting with families, getting to out in our communities and meeting with our partners and our children and our families in the community. And we have to be doing excellent case planning and thinking about all of the issues that come, of course, like housing and employment and, all, and, and certainly the opioid, um, the implications of opioid, but also substance use disorder large, writ large. Um, so, so certainly it is, capacity is one part of that stool. Um, and I think the new positions have helped with that. We're gonna keep a close eye on the data and start thinking about, you know, are we stabilizing ourselves in terms of our retention? Are we keeping people in the jobs? And again, part of getting out to the di districts is having that conversation and essentially begging people to stay as long as they will because these are excellent jobs and they are absolutely necessary, a necessary part of the state. And so helping um, to support my staff in that way, I think is certainly part of my message. Um, the second really that follows in closely is morale. Um, we have to address the morale of our staff and think about um, why people do these jobs and, um, and, and why they leave these jobs. And so, you know, certainly uh, safety is the third part of my stool and that comes into the morale piece as well. So it's sa safety of our children, it's safety of our staff, and thinking about how we 
navigate in a, in a culture um, that is, uh, you know, our staff are often threatened and um, thinking about how do, we, how do we support our staff so that they can do the best job possible. Now, in addition to that, so that was what I came in with thinking as I took this job. Um, as I mentioned before, um, children belong in their families, and so how do we do that? And in Vermont, I always say, we are small. We know our families, we know our communities, and if we can do it anywhere, we can do it here. So what does that mean, and what, is, what does that mean for how we, um, how we do our work, and how we kind of change our perspective? You know, we are a very risk-averse division, and if we're going to keep people in their families, then we're gonna to have to think about how we hold that risk and what that looks like. And, um, and so those are some of the things that have been kind of weighing on my mind. Certainly, I mentioned this before, it's a shameless plug, our data system needs, uh, Ken's gonna you know, give me the elbow, but our data system does really need um, some resources. And I, I hate that that's the case. I would love to take millions of dollars and put it somewhere else. Um, but frankly, what I'm seeing is just how it's impacting our ability to really know and track our outcomes in a way that I can say, you know, we should be able to slice and dice the data in a hundred ways. And we do, but it takes a lot of time and energy to do that. And so I just think there's, there could be some efficiencies. If, if I were in a district office looking at uh, data, would I have the capacity that you're talking about? Are you talking, is it at each district office where this is a, an issue? a challenge or is it in the collection of all the data statewide that it's the challenge? It's both because our SSMIS system is so outdated that in order for our staff to, to use it, it's just, I, I mentioned last time I was here, it's, it's from 1982 and so it's just, it's too wonky for we staff that. in the district and I'm going to keep <laughs> saying it, but no, it's, it is old and so um, the idea being that it's, it's impacting our staff on the ground in the districts but also certainly a central office. And I don't, I don't know if you have any questions to add. I just wanted to ask a question. I mean, I think he's been on the IT committee. I have been in the past. And so <laughs> the progress that we've made? I think we're slowly getting a what, is, is DCF unusual no. or just no. part of the problem? Yeah, they, they, and they aren't even. It isn't it only just state government, it's everywhere. And I think IT systems have all of us over the hill. Yes. I agree with that. I think that is quite accurate that it is not just us, it's a statewide problem. Well, no, I, I, I'm saying it's not only state government. No, I get it. Yeah. It's also yeah. out in the um, our, our designated agency is well, all designated, the support. I'm, I'm sitting in a hospital board meeting. Yeah. We have four different systems, and they're all too old, and no one knows how to get a handle on them. I think we're we're better slowly moving, but we aren't good at this. Thank you. So the challenge is IT. No, it should make you feel better. <laughs> yeah. Are Misery loves problems. company, right? Yeah. Let me be clear, it doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, dude, they want to be at the top of the list, right? That's right. No, yeah. I, the difficulty is prioritizing I know. Uh, th those upgrades. I just want to, if I might, Go ahead. one comment, and that is um, my experience over the years that the number one problem staff burnout. We're dealing with some very challenging kids and anything that can be done and I realize that it's frustrating to deal with IT problems and all these other things but I think staff burnout you're dealing with some really difficult kids and I can't imagine going you know I can imagine because I've done it going home after a long day and then you know not not taking it out on the dog or something else. So it's really, yeah. um, I hope that we, de we develop more and more understanding of the challenges that our state employees go through, and particularly in DCF, dealing with some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate that comment, and, and because you're absolutely right. We know that, and obviously Christine talked about morale, and, and that's part of what relates to, to burnout and turnover. And, I think that we have worked very hard to try to support our staff, and I think that, that we always have more to do. But it is a really challenging role. I mean, I have talked a lot in the past about um, 
how hard it must be on a day-to-day -day basis for a family service worker to have to make these incredibly challenging decisions about children and family. And it's, your point is very well taken, and we do try to, our best to support our staff, but um, it's an ongoing issue for us. I will say on a, on a bit of a positive note, because I think you hear a lot about workforce as an issue or a problem. You know, when Christine filled me in on how we're doing and filling the new positions that you authorize, it's pretty good news. <coughs> that um, within a couple of months, we have filled nine of 14 new positions. So the, the reality is, yes, it's an incredibly challenging um, role to play, but it is uh, good to know that we do have uh, people in our community that are willing and interested in entering this field. What we need to do is support them so that they stay. Well, one of the problems that we have as legislators is we are the constituents that DCF is doing this, DCF is doing that. They're people. So we recognize that our role is challenging and difficult. You know, when we're asked to do a child safety intervention because of abuse or neglect, we're walking into uh, a situation with a family, and honestly, they're not going to welcome us. We appreciate that. We try to be respectful. We try to recognize, and, and Christine, I think, has articulated very well, that we do appreciate the role of families. We also need to protect children. The reality is we know that people are not always going to be happy with our intervention. We do try to be very careful and thoughtful. Actually, I will say we also appreciate the fact that there are all these procedural safeguards. The fact is Vermont is very good about making sure every child, every parent involved in a uh, juvenile court matter has an attorney. Uh, and the child also has a guardian ad litem to at least protect. Like, to make sure that we're not overstepping um, of the appropriateness of our role. But again, I appreciate the point that I know com complaints come in. We take them very seriously when we get them. We do review cases um, when asked, and you know, we're not perfect. Um, I make mistakes. Uh, that, that is a fact of life. I think it's, for me, it's helpful to acknowledge that and recognize that and, and uh, be open to hearing um, concerns and complaints and try to improve. I just want to say I know anecdotally of good work being done with family service workers up in the St. Albans area, and I, I think if there's a way to systematically make that happen across the state, I think that, um, you know, as you say, these decisions are so difficult to make, and as much as we can minimize um, the stressors on these people making the decisions and really create a, a place for them to you know, process whatever they're dealing with. I mean, I think that we'll, we'll end up with better decisions in the end, so. But anyway, I know they have good work happening up in St. Albans. And they, and they do in Middlebury, too. I, mean, I'm, I hear good things, and I hear good things in my own district, so. I don't know about that. Senator Sears' district. I'm sure it's great. But we get the good and the bad. Yeah. All right. Any, any other questions, Kelly or Rich? Anything else well, we need to much. know? Wait, there's a lot we need to know. Okay. But this is a good. This is good. A lot, there's a lot of good stuff here. We appreciate you taking the time to to come in and share it with us. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good. Good luck on the road trip. Thank you. And going to Washington. Okay. So the child care advocate or ombudsman model um, is something that I know that many folks have been talking about and are interested in. So we've invited in um, Amy Brady, um, your first on the list. And if there's anyone, if you decide that you need to call someone else up at the same time, you can do that. But we can all come together. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That would be great. So Rachel, I have a PowerPoint, but it doesn't work because that's gonna be up. So you'll have a copy of it. I'm yes. sure. We have a copy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think we all do. We have it also yeah. on our. On our iPad. Um, so. Yeah, it should be on your iPad. It's posted, okay. Cool. But we good. had some technical issues with this. It's screen. always prettier on the iPad, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Representative Pugh is on her way. She'll be here at 1:30. So we'll have this. So you are. We're looking at meeting the needs of children's. Children in Vermont's care. Is that the one we're looking at? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So I'm going to 
So to start, I'm Amy Brady. I'm a policy associate with Choices for Vermont's Children. Full disclosure, I'm also a foster parent to a remarkable five-year-old daughter who also woke me up six times last night, so I'm trying my best to be clear <laughs> thinking. Um, I truly appreciate the opportunity to offer a broad overview of an Office of Child Advocate. I plan to start with some reflections on the current system in order to articulate why an OCA is a logical next step for Vermont. As you just heard, the numbers fluctuate, but we had 1,182 substantiated victims of abuse or neglect in 2018. We know that these numbers are higher than they've been in the past. We would like to see them go down, if it's appropriate. Without minimizing the amount of work that needs to be done, I find hope in the scale of Vermont. We can get this right. We can assume good intent by all, these kids have an army of people who are there to make sure that their needs are met. They have their biological family, often their foster family, DCF staff, court, community providers, educators, and more. I truly believe that we can make Vermont a model state. We have to start with some questions. How are we doing? Right now, it is really difficult to know. What measures are we using? What data do we have? We've heard quite a bit of testimony that our data is lacking. I'm watching youth in my community as they experience foster care. Some of them soften when they enter a safe home. Others crumble. Their attachment grows to become reactive and their behaviors escalate. They often blame themselves for their situation. They feel rejected. They feel disconnected. We need to listen to these youth in order to better meet our needs. So for our data, the data that I've seen has a few themes that are worth noting. Children and youth who have experienced our foster care system have less desirable outcomes than their peers. This is not surprising. Foster care is a response to trauma or neglect, and removing a child from a home is also traumatic. But in an equitable state, these children would have the supports that they need to have comparable outcomes to their peers. We do need more data, but we also know <coughs> enough to know that we can improve. We have stories. I have spent a lot of time listening. There's seriously a lack of trust in our current DCF system. I've hosted meetings with youth, with foster parents, with kinship care providers, with families of origin, with women in the Chittenden Correctional Facility, with service providers, people connected to the courts, and more. I always start out by asking just three questions. What is working well? What would you like to change? And typically, I'm there for about two hours and we never get to the third question. And the third question is really the most important one. It's if you could dream up a system that works without limitations, what would it look like? The limitation of stories is that there is no way to see the full picture. DCF is unable to respond for multiple reasons, including confidentiality constraints, lack of time to do the relational work that is necessary to build trust. So people who hear about DCF are left with many unanswered questions and one-sided stories. The lack of transparency does not instill trust. I have asked two people to join me and will make sure to leave plenty of time for them to share their stories. I am honored and grateful for the vulnerability people have offered me time and time again. They can do a much better job of sharing their experiences than I ever could in a recap. Now the next slide may not present itself well to the folks behind us, but it's just a picture from a newspaper in Massachusetts. And it's intended to demonstrate the piece that even at its very best, the in interventions that we pose, impose are traumatic. And it's a story of a, a little girl who was wrongfully picked up at a daycare um, facility in Massachusetts. Um, the social worker had come and accidentally picked up the wrong girl with the same first name. And what's remarkable to me about this story is that the response of the family is this response that many folks would have if this had happened to their own child. I'm just going to read a couple pieces since it's not up there. It says, 
I'm getting a call, don't freak out, but your daughter was mistaken for another Aria. Although Kinder Care said Nikolaho's daughter was returned within an hour, the child's grandmother said the damage had already been done. I said, what did you do? Aria said, they took me and gave me toys to play with. Leonard said, were you scared? You didn't know this lady. She said, yeah, Nana, I was very scared. The bottom line later in the story is they're all saying this is unacceptable. The experience of removing a child from their home is traumatic, even when it's done incredibly well. And we know that sometimes it's necessary. The message that I have heard most clearly is that we need to listen to kids more. They're consistently reporting that they are not being heard. They consistently report that the investigator or the family support worker built a relationship with them, got them to talk, then disappeared after that. They lost all control of their lives and no one talks to them anymore. And this is unacceptable. We all know that the cost of inaction is high. My favorite quote is from the Citizens for Juvenile Justice. We start out recognizing them as victims, then fail to help them heal, and eventually punish them for expressing their pain. Our child protection system has a profound responsibility. The state is given power to intervene on behalf of children. Once we do that, are we meeting our commitment to these kids? <coughs> so we ask ourselves questions. Are we at our best? If we say a parent is neglectful, is the state modeling responsive parenting? If we say a child's dental needs and medical needs have been neglected, is that child getting to the dentist and the doctor after they come into care? If we say that a child was abused and requires supervised contact, are we offering that in a way that helps the child heal? heal? Is our child, I mean, is our system child-centered? Do the youth transitioning into independent independence have all that they need for their adult lives? We shouldn't assume that poor outcomes are a direct result of poor practice, or that good outcomes are a direct result of good practice. We are left with many questions and many opportunities for advocacy. So the question arises, do we know what it will take to improve? We have an abundance of research, which will continue to evolve. We have some state data, but would benefit from more. I am personally a member of several work groups, and there are many more, each working on different pieces of the system. There are stakeholder groups as well, for kinship parents, foster parents, and youth. However, we are still lacking an independent, unbiased, comprehensive evaluation of our system. We do not know what we do know is that there is room for improvement. We also know that we are operating under human services. Our system will always be a human system. This is a strength, but it increases the need for accountability. Even in a well-designed system, family support workers have their own biases, their own stress, and their own lives. We can't expect them to be at their very best 100% of the time. But each child and family is entitled to the best that this system can offer. The urgency for them is acute. Which is why an Office of Child Advocate is a critical component of a functioning system. One piece of this very large puzzle that is missing is external oversight. Transparency is a hallmark of a properly functioning government. DCF routinely asks families to be vulnerable in order to become better and we are asking the state to do the same. If we know that kids will be better off, then we can take that risk. We are missing, we are missing the power of a well-articulated public voice that creates a cycle of, un, I'm sorry. The current cycle is unhealthy for our kids. Right now, there's a lack of public voice until a tragedy happens. Then it becomes blame. A person is often vilified. We wonder which policies and practices were not followed. It gets quiet and the cycle repeats. The Office of Child Advocate in New Hampshire has been structured in a way to be incredibly effective. They have the luxury of listening with 
without the other responsibilities that family support workers have. They're made up of two components. They have an ombudsperson and a child advocate. The ombudsperson responds to complaints with a credible review process, builds collaborative relationships for reform, maintains independence and impartiality, and listens to and informs the system. The child advocate turns complaints into building blocks for better outcomes, performs random and targeted case review to better understand trends, and makes recommendations to DCF, policymakers, and the public. There has been some concern that an Office of Child Advocate could create unsafety for the DCF workers who are already scrutinized often in the community. I've spoken to family support workers in other states who have similar offices and they reported the opposite. They said that they are most at risk when a family feels that the system is not working for them and they have no one to turn to and no one to listen to their story. I'd included a couple of voices from the field and I'm gonna hold off on sharing them and to, in order to give time to our other guests, but if there's time, I'd like to come back to them afterwards. If I don't get to them, they're in your PowerPoint, but they're um, statements from DCF workers in New Hampshire as well as some testimony that I've handed out to you from Dr. Moira O'Neill, who is the current New Hampshire Office of Child Advocate. She says that state advocates or ombudsmen may currently be the fastest growing sector of government, reflecting the widespread recognition that children's rights are limited and their voices are often unheard. An Office of Child Advocate is a critical component of a well-functioning system designed properly, it will instill trust when the system is operating as intended. It will catch individual transgressions before they cause permanent harm. And it will give the state an independent view of where to invest its time and its resources. If given the chance, I'd be happy to talk more about the current bill, H215. My goal is to make the system work for children. Many of your colleagues have told me, we need to do something different. What can we do? In the past, I have agreed with more DCF workers, and I still believe that we need more capacity within DCF, but I don't think that's the only solution. Without comprehensive reform, we will continue to see the themes that keep many of us up at night. <coughs> I've used New Hampshire as our example today, and they have become my go-to because they are newly established and have been extremely effective. However, Washington, Colorado, and other states have been very helpful resources, and we have a lot to learn from all of the offices. Colorado in particular, as they have been structured within a nonprofit setting and also as an independent government office. We are the only state in New England without an Office of Child Advocate and are missing a valuable opportunity to participate in regional think tank convenings for systematic reform. I'm going to pause and ask Rachel to jump in. Thank you. My name is Rachel Brosman. Um, I work as a family support would, worker. Would you mind speaking? Oh, I'm sorry, it, sure. Is that better? Yes, sorry. please, it's good. good. Okay. My name is Rachel Brosman, and my position is family support worker, not to be confused with DCF. The Defender General's office runs a program called Family Support Worker, and I, work with parents who have children who are in DCF custody. And I work with them to help them navigate the system, which is confusing. Um, so I'm just gonna start off by telling you about two families that I've worked with and some of the patterns and issues that come up with for many families. Um, all the names are not real names. So. so Deborah has three children. Deborah also has a cognitive disability. Her oldest child was taken into custody when it was discovered that she had a severe medical condition that had gone undiagnosed. Her younger two children were also taken into custody. Deborah's DCF caseworker didn't understand her disability, nor did the nurse at the hospital who tried to teach her how to manage her child's complex medical condition, nor did the Easter Seals worker who provided family time coaching, which is a program that they run where parents have um, someone observe them with their children and they have um, time to be given feedback and suggestions. Um, no one at any point in the process acknowledged her cognitive disability and made an effort to provide reasonable accommodations. 
As a result, she failed to grasp the intricacies of her child's medical condition, and her family time coaching was ended due to lack of progress. Right now, the cards are stacked against Deborah's family reuniting, not because Deborah can't do it. With the supports that can be put in place, I have no doubt that she can parent her children. But the clock is ticking, and two of the children are in pre-adopted homes. It's looking like these three children will grow up in three separate households. This family will most likely be split apart, and that's because of failures in the system, not because Deborah can't parent her children with good supports in place. We can do better than that. The second family I'm going to tell you about is Sandy and Michael. Sandy and Michael have two children who were taken into custody. These children absolutely needed state intervention. Sandy and Michael's apartment was beyond messy. It was unsanitary. Sandy and Michael were not attending to their children's medical needs. Their oldest child has a disability, and his unique medical issues were not being addressed. <coughs> However, this was a wake-up call for these parents. They snapped to attention. They cleaned up their apartment, and they kept it clean. They immediately began cooperating with all providers to attend to their children's needs. Keeping our children safe is a huge challenge, especially when it entails removing children from their parents' custody. It is a confusing, bewildering situation that is traumatizing for every member of the affected family. Our system, while not perfect, can work. I have seen it work. I have seen parents whose children come into custody and, like Sandy and Michael, get right to work. They go to counseling, they take parenting classes, they fully engage in family time coaching, they find stable housing, they work on a budget. In short, they work hard, change their behavior, and regain custody of their children. And this is what happens in the best case scenario. However, we all know that ideal scenarios are usually the exception rather than the rule. And even in an otherwise ideal scenario, the entire family suffers trauma from being separated. When it is less than ideal, which unfortunately is more often the case, the trauma is even more heartbreaking and long-lasting. Parents whose children are taken into custody love their children just as fiercely as you and I love our children. And their children love them just as much as our children love us. Not every child will have an ideal life, and obviously hardly anybody does. <laughs> but every child has the right to the life he, she, or they were born to within reason, and that's where the rub is. I have the right to the life I was born to, and you, the community, in the form of the state, have an obligation to make sure that I am safe in that life. I'm going to share with you some of the observations, some of my observations of the dire consequences for families that can often occur when the state steps in. Deborah's children were in 13 different foster homes over a two and a half year period. Currently, those children are in three separate foster homes. How do children feel when they are moved that many times? Scared that it's their fault that they were removed from the home? That if somehow they were better, their foster families would have kept them? Probably all of the above. This is trauma. I worked with another family whose son had been in a stable foster home for almost a year. Then his behavior got really challenging and the foster parents said they could not keep him anymore. In trying to find another placement, he was moved six times in the two-week period. More than one of those six foster parents brought him to school one day with his belongings and called DCF <coughs> and said that, they, that he could not return to their home that day. They were done now, today. Unfortunately, I learned that while not common, this scenario has happened before with other children. Imagine this child's trauma. Do you think this is a child who feels worthy of love? On hearing this story, my first reaction was horror and disbelief. How could anyone do that to a child? However, as I thought about it, I remember that DCF workers spend their days putting out fires. My guess is that the foster parents have tried several times to reach their DCF worker. Not knowing that this was a five alarm fire, the DCF worker didn't return the call. Or perhaps the worker didn't even have time to hear the voicemail. Or perhaps, believe it or not, there were six alarm fires the worker was dealing with. The foster parent was desperate. The child's behavior was probably so disruptive at that point that they could not compromise their own family's life any longer. Surprisingly, there is trauma even in a good foster care situation. One of Deborah's children, now in her 14th foster home, that by all, appearance, all appearances is stable, is now telling her foster parent 
parents that she doesn't want to return home, but she also tells her mother that she does want to live at home. This is typical of what children go through. This child, who has been moved around so often, is now in a home that seems stable to her. Foster parents can provide so many more opportunities, camp, extracurricular activities, and material things. Of course, this child is confused. She loves her mother and siblings and wants to be with them, but things are okay where she is now. And just a little aside there, um, one of the flaws that I think we all have is we tend not to respond to people who are disenfranchised or less education, less money, the same way we respond to other people. And so the foster parents, when, when that foster parent said, oh, you know, this child's saying she doesn't want to go home now, everybody hopped to attention. That was scary, you know, oh, we really have to look at this. Mom says, she's telling me she wants to come home. I didn't see the same response from the professionals involved. And, and that's, that's a systemic problem, um, and it's a hard one, but it was definitely another mark against the mom, and oh my gosh, now what? The kid's saying she doesn't want to go home. Not, oh, this kid really wants to go home. She doesn't know what she wants. Anyway, um, so visitation is also always an important piece for every family whose children have been taken into custody. Yet visitation can be very challenging, too. DCF tries to schedule as many family visits as possible, but it's a strain on everyone. When Sandy and Michael's children were taken into custody, and by the way, they found out about it when they came out of school that day, the judge had ordered custody, so when they got out of school, I don't know if their parents were there or not, hopefully they were, but they were told that day, um, you're, you're going into foster care, and boom, that was it. Um, and I don't know if there's a better way to do that. But anyway, when they were taken into custody, Sandy had just begun working at a convenience store. She told her boss the situation, and her boss said she would work with her so that Sandy would be able to attend the visits, all the visits with her children and participate in all other DCF requirements and still keep her job. That was week one. By week three, her job was in jeopardy because DCF had changed the vis visitation schedule so many times. Sandy's boss really wanted to work with her, but she had a business to run. Sadly, I have seen visitation schedules very fluid in many other cases. A visit schedule was created for Sandy and Michael's older son that took him out of school for a noontime visit that would last an hour. This schedule went into effect the first week of foster care. Whose idea was this? How can a child who is scared, confused, and traumatized of being taken from his parents possibly have a productive day in school after a one hour visit in the middle of the day? Sandy was the one who saw that this was not in her child's best interest and asked for a new schedule. The new schedule was not much better. Visits were then scheduled for 8 a.m. before school. This is just one example. There are many permutations of this <coughs> scenario, all equally traumatic for children and their parents. There are other financial implications as well. In Sandy and Michael's case, one of their children was receiving SSI. His SSI helped to pay the rent. One of the children were removed from the home. Sandy and Michael were at risk of losing their housing because of that. Deborah lives in subsidized housing and can afford the apartment for her family. After the children were in custody for about a year, the housing authority said you have to downsize to a two-bedroom apartment. We can't hold this four-bedroom um, if your family isn't here. In both cases, inadequate housing will be a barrier to reunification. I'm not suggesting that we do not ask parents to attend classes, counseling, and participate in a myriad of activities that will enhance their parenting skills. I am suggesting that we need to take care of those families financially. It is absolutely criminal that we allow families to lose housing when they lose custody of their children. I have pointed out many flaws in an imperfect system, and I could have gone on a lot longer. <laughs> um, and there are positives, but it's hardening to see this committee working on solutions. An Office of Child Advocacy would ensure that we are looking at systemic issues and give direction in finding out what's working and what is not working. It would also provide an independent office parents can access when they need assistance. The families that I just described to you are by no means exceptions. I can change the names and the circumstances and issues are the same. 
The last time this committee met, there was discussion about having an in independent mediators involved as soon as the children are taken into custody. This is another way that could decrease tension between parents and DCF right from the start, creating a much better scenario for all the parties. I also believe that every parent should have a support person. Honestly, I am not trying to self-promote. However, the Defender General's Family Support Program is an effective way to support parents. And I can tell you that in Deborah's situation, I was able to get work with her and she now has a case manager from Washington County Mental Health who will be hers for life, who works with her on personal goals and parenting, and there are many other supports that agency um, may be able to give her. She, um, I was able to get her training at a hospital where they acknowledged her disability and worked with her. I helped her go to ABE, Adult Basic Education, so that she could get help with the math involved in her child's, in managing her child's disability. And lastly, Home Health is coming in and supervising her so that she can put her knowledge to use. It may all be too little too late, but that's just an example of what was done because she had someone for her. Um, and the DCF social workers don't have time for that sort of social work. And lastly, to use an overused phrase, let's think outside the box. If Deborah can't manage her child's medication but can effectively parent in every other way, surely there must be another solution besides adoption. Let's think about other ways to facilitate visits between families that are separated that work better for everyone's schedule. And here's another solution for Sandy and Michael's children. Sandy and Michael can keep their children safe from 5 p.m. when they get home from school or daycare until 8 a.m. the next morning when they go to school. Send them home now. And if you don't feel like they can keep them safe on the weekends, send them to respite on the weekend. Much less traumatic than full-time foster care. There must be creative solutions to many of the problems the system faces, solutions that keep families together, solutions that create less trauma for everyone, especially the children, when they are removed from the home. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, that's probably better. Usually I don't need a mic, but I'm going to do it I will apologize in advance. I am feeling just a little bit under the weather right now. So if I cough, I'm sorry. Um, thank you guys for letting me come in today. Uh, my name is Nate Farnham. I'm 20 years old. I was a DCF ward of the state from May 26th of 2006 until uh, September of last year. Um, I was working with Dan Noyes a lot last year to pass um, H255, the Prudent Parent Standard Act. Um, and I actually worked with Dan. Um, I know me and Amy have been talking about this before. I worked and me and Dan have talked a lot as well. And he wants to start helping youth in DCF with a lot of stuff that we can do. So we all work to put this bill um, into place. I have attended. Uh, two national youth leadership conferences, one in D.C. and one in California, where I met with youth advocacy groups from all over the United States. And last year was actually one group from Canada as well. Um, and I've learned a lot about what ombudsmen's do in their states, for the states that have them, the Office of Child Advocate. And my biggest question is why didn't why don't we have that here, and why haven't we had that here when other states have had this position for a substantial amount. I believe that this position can more than help youth uh, when they have a grievance against uh, anyone in the system, whether it be DC workers or not, uh, whether you know the foster parents have an issue that they're dealing with, whether uh, the biological parents have an issue. Um, I remember a lot of the time I had a couple of different issues with a couple of different DCF workers that I had. Um, I would file a grievance and would hear that and no resolution would come out of my grievance that I had filed. Um, so I feel like this bill is more than needed in the state. I feel like it's been needed for quite a while now. Uh, I've been doing youth advocacy for about four years now, and originally I was only doing policy change in DCF, and now that I'm getting into doing more of the legislative work, I actually am falling in love with it quite substantially. I like to do this stuff. I want to see change in the system. I don't want to have to see 
fellow youth um, go through all the stuff I went through. I mean, in my 13 years, I went through 32 different foster homes, eight to 10 residential treatment facilities, and I did three stays at the Barbara over treatment for medication stabilization. Within a year and a half, I was there for six months, I was out for 24 hours, and I was back in. And I went through probably 20 different medications in that 18 months of trying to get me on the right medication. You're fading away. Sorry, I, my voice is out of it right now. I know. I've been battling it's a not for easy. three days. No, it's really not. Um, so that's why I'm here to testify. Um, I want to see this bill get passed. I want to see the Office of Child Advocate get in. Um, I'd like to see the ombudsman position be uh, filled into the state as well, um, because I believe that they are two substantially vital positions that this uh, state's DCF system has been lacking for quite a while. So, thank you guys. Thank you. Questions? I got Turning it over to representative. No, 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 Pierre. you finish this because uh, I'm not talking. Question? Yeah, I do, but... Go. Oh, yes. no. Um, I, I guess, before you start, before I start, I'll tell you who I am. <coughs> I'm the running of the Lakeview Kids in Bennington. Um, I've been a foster parent, <coughs> and I may see the system from a different point of view than some of you. And I see a system that is broken, I agree, but I, I'm not sure that the problem is solved by having more people. I think the problem is solved by having the courts do their job and making the right decisions. And when somebody should be taken out of the home and when they shouldn't be. It is an extremely difficult job to be a foster parent. It is the most difficult job I ever did. Let me tell you a little bit about my experience as a foster parent. And maybe an ombuds person could help me as a foster parent. I have a kid in my, in my home with my wife and I who is doing very well. That freaked out his mother, who then did everything she could to undermine the placement. Now, you may be taking the mother's side on this, and you may, and you may. But let me tell you, that kid is currently in jail and will be, uh, for a long time, some very serious crimes. And when he was 14 or 15, we had an opportunity to make a difference. We chose not to. We chose to undermine the system. And I blame the system for that. That's long before Ken Schatz or anybody here. I'm going way back. So those are some of my experiences as a foster parent. And yet you want to um, get involved in that <coughs> and make it more difficult to uh, provide permanency for that kid in a foster care situation. Um, and I, so I, you know, I really question that. Now I've had. I've had successes, I've had failures in my period of time as a working in uh, residential treatment. Um, you know, our, our failures stand out like a sore thumb because they usually make the headlines. But I really have a hard time with some of what was presented here today. So I'm going to try to uh, keep an open mind, but I just want to tell you that from my perspective, Getting to permanency, whether it be foster care or whatever it is, is the most important thing. And if it's going back home with the parent, when you have, you know, it, it's usually not two parents, it's one. Let me tell you one of the most difficult things I've seen kids bigger than you, tougher than you, sit and cry, waiting for mama to show up on a Sunday afternoon because she couldn't be bothered. Okay? So, don't give me this line about everything is going to be fine. That's where I have a problem. What are you going to do for that kid? Are you going to tell him he's going back to this woman who can't care enough to get there on Sunday? Or I'll give you another one. We were across the street from a bar. How do you deal with two kids in your program and both mother and father are out there kissing in front of the bar, but hey, they ain't the mother and father of the they're the mother and father, but they ain't the ones that are married. So they see that, you know? And I, so 
you know, this is what social workers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, what burns out some of them. And they make lousy decisions. And I don't have mind to have an overview, an oversight of those decisions. But how is that going to help the, those kids that I just described? I really appreciate the questions. Um, I hope you do. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I truly do. I think really that where the problem lies. I think that it's complex always. And that is why my vision of the Off the Child Advocate is truly child-centered, not parent-centered, not DCF-centered. It's to make the system work for kids. Um, to your point about the workers, I skipped over the voices from the field just because I wanted to make sure that our other guests had an opportunity to speak as well. But I'd love to go back to that and just share a little bit about how an Office of Child Advocate has helped workers in New Hampshire in these really challenging situations try to figure out what is best. and. And like in the situation you shared, give foster parents, biological families, and youth an outside perspective so that they can call in when they feel like the situation isn't working as intended. So like in your first scenario, if you felt like the parent reunification was not the right approach, you would have the opportunity to call somebody else outside the system, talk it through, and get a response back. So if you, if you have a moment, I'd love to just share a little bit about, about what they have said. The first one is from Katie LaBelle. Uh, she's a safety program specialist from the Division of Children, Youth, and Family in New Hampshire. In my opinion, the OCA has brought a much needed spotlight to the work of the division that has been missing for some time. While there are individuals within the division that struggle with the oversight piece the OCA provides, I find additional eyes and attention on the welfare of New Hampshire's children only to be a positive change. Within my role, I have been working to drive various initiatives forward, and the OCA has provided some much-needed support. Initiatives such as focusing on substance-exposed infants and our policies regarding our work with them and their families, revamping how we conduct our critical incident reviews to reflect what modern safety science tells us about negative outcomes, and educating the legislature on the need for additional funding not just for positions within DCYF, but for additional community services to support our work as well. I recently had the privilege to be a part of the OCA's first SLR, which is a Systems Learning Review, which was a review of two of the child deaths that occurred last year. I was very impressed with the work that the OCA has done with collaborative safety, and not just learning about modern safety science and applying it to the work of child welfare, but also following through and implementing and conducting their own review process which I believe will only strengthen the work of the division. I am hoping to assist in bring that same lens to how the division conducts reviews as the feedback from the division staff that have participated in SLR reviews was very positive. And then she goes on to continue that, to um, encourage us to continue our work. But I think you speak to a really important part of the system. Um, as an office, we often get calls from parents and grandparents who are frustrated that their children have been removed and removed, we get just as many calls from foster parents who are frustrated, feeling that their children are unsafe or the system is not working in the best interest of the kids in their care. And I think it's complex. And what I do know about the current system is that DCF workers do not always have the luxury in their day to take those calls and listen to the full story, which is often two, three, four hours, and then to do the research to find out what is behind the stories, and the Office of Child Advocate would have that ability to both have access to the information so they can see the whole picture, but also just to listen and to see if there's little details that come out around safety that may have been missed in a, in a quick 10-15 um, minute check-in. So uh, I'm going to let Representative Red, Redmond ask a question, but just a comment um, for, for those of us at the table that there is a letter in our, on our, online with the committee from the Office of Child Advocate from the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, we've got a hard copy too. Yeah, okay, all right, so go okay. ahead. Um, this is a question for you, Nate. I, I'm curious the legislation that you've put together with Representative Noyes, how do you think having that in place could have potentially changed things for you? Like if you can make that kind of direct connection, like how do you think it would have impacted your experience. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, so, with uh, the Prudent Parent Standard Act that uh, <coughs> I worked with Representative Noyes on, um, a lot of that actually started to come into effect 
before it became legislation about two and a half to three years before I got out of the system, uh, which was a lot of DCF policy change in regards to normalcy, uh, which is trying to make uh, youths uh, stay in foster care more like a normal childhood rather than some of the stuff that some of these youth go through that isn't really what a child should be going through when they're growing up. Um, so a lot of that, like I said, was being put into place a couple of years before I left, but had that been in, in place from the day I went in, um, I don't think my amount of places I went to would have been the same. I don't think I would have gone through as many foster homes as I did. Um, I wouldn't have been through every place in my life that could accept me and had to go over to New Hampshire for two programs over there. Um, because no place for all would take me. I had to go and spend two and a half years over in New Hampshire. Um, so I, if that had, if the Prudent Parent Standard Act and all normalcy um, legislation, legislation and policy had been in place prior to me going into the system, um, I definitely think it would have been a better outcome. Um, I definitely think that a lot of the youth I grew up with that were in the system wouldn't have had it. Uh, like we all did, I think it would have been a lot better. Um, I believe some of the issues that um, Senator Sears had described, maybe a few of those would have been a little different. Um, I'm not saying that they would, I'm not saying that they wouldn't have, but maybe a few of them might have been a, a, on a slightly different angle um, of occurrence if that stuff had been in place, um, because that allows the foster parents to really be more of an actual parent to the youth in care, um, instead of having to play, you know, find a DCF worker at six in the morning to go sign a field, sl uh, field trip slip. They can do all that stuff. Sign them up for extracurricular activities, sports, etc. So a lot of the stuff that a youth needs when they're growing up to be able to, you know, grow as a youth, um, it definitely would have changed my perspective and probably my outcome. And definitely a lot of youth I grew up with for sure. Other questions? No, I think you guys Okay. I do want to make clear I, the number of foster placements is a problem. start again so I do apologize um, so I've come in late um, and when I came in <clears throat> what I was hearing was um, conversation and support for someone to uh, for lack of a better term to work individually with individual situations and um, is that what you are advocating for um, is there any um, is there a need? Is it superfluous? Um, <clears throat> are you looking for addressing systemic issues and having an outside um, entity not attached to state government to look at systems issues? Absolutely. Um, I think why the system um, of the Child Advocate has worked so well in New Hampshire is that they have both components. So they have an ombudsperson who answers the calls and is able to listen and triage um, and hopefully address transgressions before they become more significant, but also to, re to help instill trust when things are happening as intended. But they take that information and they do random and targeted case reviews to see if the calls that they are getting are representative of a bigger issue within one specific region or across the state. And if kids' needs are not being met, it's a result of the need for policy change or practice change. And do that they produce reports annually around um, all of their findings. And so the, the key component of this office is the Office of Child Advocate piece, which is the person who really addresses the systemic issues and um, 
produces reports, creates the data to say what is functioning well and what could be what could be changed. And I've heard recently that New Hampshire has a lot of changes happening in our in their state right now. And um, if you have time, I can read to you the testimony from Dr. O'Neill. Um, I think that she is a large part of of the urgency that was created for that change. Um. You might phone a friend, or I might phone a friend. I believe the, the state has a statewide child protection team. Is that what it is? Yes, the, the child the, protection. Uh, the thing with Joe Hagan and all those people. Yes, we have. Well, we have the Vermont uh, Citizen Advisory Board. What? Are you talking about the Vermont Citizen Advisory Board? No. No. No, we do have a child protection team. That we, we have a child fatality review team. We yeah, have, but, yes, so we do have these um, teams. Maybe we'll either. That's the next step. Yeah. What? That's the next step. That's the next step to understand uh, where, right. um, what is what. What is what and where do we have and are. <clears throat> and so I, the impetus for, for my question was more in terms of um, the experience in New Hampshire, if you're can answer that as to whether or not the <coughs> office of th their systems function is that their um, statewide job protection team um, or is that I mean is that built on that model and they just call it something different or do they because I think every state has to have one yeah. right I agree with you. So what I do know is that um, New Hampshire is the last established, the newly established office of child advocate. They only began within the last two years, and they've had significant changes in this legislative cycle um, that seems to be directly connected to the reports that they put out and the relationship that they've they formed with their governor and the legislative body. Um, I can find out more about how that connects to their new team. I mean, I just, I mean, um, if this is something that people, either this committee or various committees in the House are interested in, we need to sort of understand what the current system structure is for quote unquote oversight. And Whether am, it's the Citizens Advisory Board. So I'm currently a member of the Citizens Advisory Board as well. Um, it's <coughs> quarterly and we do one case review that's often chosen um, within the department to address an issue that has come up. Um, but it's very limited in scope, and people aren't able to call in and bring concerns to that in the same way that the Office of Child Advocate would be. It's more, um, it serves as a chance for folks to give policy support or advice or experiences from the field, but there isn't a staff position where people can access it Around. Um, and are there, are there regular students. people on that? Are they all people who um, have contracts with the state or are state employees and from different agencies? It's a mix. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm looking at the, at the next um, set of part of the agenda, and so I'm assuming that we're going to be learning, and I'm looking at you, Amy, because you're on, on there first, but that we're going to be learning about what exactly the ombudsman versus advocate is. But not what necessarily here. This is that federal law. Oh, this is the federal law. Yeah. That's the yeah. federal law. Okay. And I had a, that was actually, I just had a question. Okay, and that so was my question. Go there. Was it, if you could um, be a little bit more clear about what the differences between the two roles are, because I feel like there's a, the ombudsman, um, there's that sense that it will make it more difficult for um, the adults in the picture, but that the child advocate piece is really there to give voice to the children that are in the system, and so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I appreciate that question. So the goal of both positions is to make things better for the children in the system. I feel like my biggest frustration with the way things are currently is that the system is designed to be effective, and oftentimes when people have to meet different requirements, um, the children get lost. And so I can give many examples, um, and I think that's part of why we need somebody who can 
distill all the information into the most useful tidbit. But um, the ombuds person could get calls from individual children and youth. They could get calls from community members, service providers, educators, legislators who say this constituent's been calling me for a long time and I just don't know what to do. Foster parents or biological families. It's really the whole community can call in and say, I'm noticing this area of concern. I'm concerned about this kid's safety. I'm concerned that their needs are not being met. Um, and they will have access to records and files, which currently nobody else does. So they will be able to look into it and see <coughs> if the system is functioning as intended. And if it's not functioning as intended, often they build a strong relationship with their local DCF office and are able to call them and say, can you take a second look at this? This is not feeling right. This child is not getting their needs met. Um, what I'm hearing is concerning. And when things are going as expected, they're able to listen and be assured of the people in the community that this is the way the system was designed and what their opportunities are for input in the process and just kind of lower that anxiety because whenever somebody is connected to the system, anxiety levels are high and people um, often act out of frustration and fear and are not always at their best self. <laughs> and so they can help just kind of talk them through what to expect. And I think that's pretty important because the ombuds person also is gathering that information and figuring out what trends there are. You know, if they're getting 15 calls from St. Albans saying kids are going home before all the school plans have been met, then they're going to pull more files from St. Albans and say, what's happening in this community? Or if they're getting a call, yeah. Just before you continue, I'm, I'm looking at your slide that has ombuds and child advocate. And so, and I'm getting confused because the child advocate is going to have the authority to go through files. The ombudsperson is the one who's going to make a determination about whether or not the complaint is credible and then go through the files. I'm trying to figure out how these two folks work together and, and what, are, what, are they, what are they doing. Um, and if, if and one of the things that it seems clear here that you're suggesting that it needs to be independent of the of DCF that it has to be an outside investigation process um, and how would that dovetail with the internal evaluation process so there are a lot of questions yeah, I think great questions. And so the way it's structured in New Hampshire and the way that it works best is when the Office of Child Advocate includes an ombudsman in that. So it's not two separate <coughs> offices, two separate um, entities. They're working collaboratively in one, in one setting. And so um, in New Hampshire, Dr. Weiner O'Neill is the child advocate. She does the big systems review, but she works with Emily Lawrence, who is the ombudsperson, um, daily in the same office space. And they um, share information that they're gathering she takes a lot of Emily's reports and she chooses to use it to um, investigate things further. And she's also on a lot of the statewide panels. And, um, and so they, they need each other in order to get a picture of what's happening. Without information from the field, it's really hard to know what to look for and where. Um, but the Office of Child Advocate position, the director position, is the person who does the systemic system review. Okay. Kelly, did you want to follow up? No, no. That I do think, though, your your question, your point is good, though. Understanding how that would work with the current um, DC, you know, the DCF oversight system that's in place, like, it would be important to understand how that would function. Yeah, and so um, I think it's important to know that the Office of Child Advocate um, cannot step in and interfere in court. They're not able to stop a process that's happening. They're able to offer their input, and so it would. Um, Currently, if there's a complaint process that's pretty well available online, and what happens is if a child or a youth has a complaint, then they can go to the DCF staff. And if they don't feel like the, result, the complaint was resolved, or they don't feel that they hadn't heard back, then they can go to a supervisor and they can work up the chain of command. Um, the ombuds person is just an independent person who is able to look at the situation without having been a part of the process. And that's where it becomes very valuable for um, youth to feel like they've been heard, and also for the community to feel like the system is functioning. 
Um, if you call DCF and say that we feel like there was a misstep and don't get a call back, and then call a supervisor and don't get a call back, and then call somebody and don't get a call back, and then somebody above takes their call and says, we think everything's fine. You don't feel as though the process has worked for you. And so offering an opportunity for somebody from the outside to take a look and to explain their process has been found to be really helpful. Other questions? But there's a lot here. It's a lot, and the it's dev has a lot. Of awful lot. I would love to go through that in the future. Right. So, so it, somewhat of an analogy to a healthcare advocate, but not quite. Slightly different. Similar. <clears throat> Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We probably could talk about this for a long time, but this is a good start. I think, and um, so, and I know that the, the you, there's a bill in your committee, is there? <coughs> Representative Noise, Noise is yeah. the prime yeah. sponsor, yeah. It was interesting, introduced by Representative Q and Representative Noise. But I have an open, actually, it's Representative Noise is the prime sponsor, and I actually am interested in not the bill per se, but what the issue is and what we need to do to address some of the, um, challenges that both um, DCF and the Defender General and the state's attorneys and community providers are talking about and we all, all of us in the legislature I think or many of us did just, um, <clears throat> the Vermont Parent Representation Center it continues to um, send, <clears throat> um, express their concerns and uh, um, I think um, we probably need to hear from them as well as hear from DCF in terms of their. Do you have any idea what it costs in New Hampshire? It's about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. <coughs> How much? Three hundred fifty thousand. Okay. On, that's that's ongoing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm good. We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So we're scheduled to take a break. Um, how many but people are? Um, so I'm turning it over now to okay. Representative Pugh. <laughs> oh God, that's a mistake. <clears throat> um, Becky, I'm going to ask you, people on the phone, um, did we give them particular time periods? I can email them and ask them if they'll be ready. I mean, I wonder, yeah. you know, just if we can take. Um, like a 10 minute break or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and then come back. Mm -hmm. um, um, sir, are you Tim Decker? I am. Oh, God, I'm smart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pick up the guy with the tie in the room, right? Uh, so uh, he's got to be an outsider. <laughs> <laughs> and so, why, you know, rather than so take, a, outsider, rather than take, take, take a half an hour break. break. Mm -hmm. What about small states or what about, you know, money or whatever? And there was a possibility of. Um, Delaying certain things, and I know we weren't on the agenda, but fill us in where we are today. Certainly. So, Christine Johnson, Deputy Commissioner with the DCF Family Services Division. Um, and just really quickly, um, just want to let you know that um, coming in again, being new to my role, one of the first um, considerations was about Family First, uh, Family First Prevention Services Act. And um, of course, I started to ask questions about where are we with this act, you know, and and really got a sense that we had done some initial cost analysis and realized that for a small state, with the economy of scale, it was potentially going to cost us a fair amount of money. And so there was some reticence, I think, in, in really moving it forward. The idea then, uh, and when I came in, was that we would ask the federal government for the two-year delay, which is what the act allows, and that we would continue to plan um, within the purview of that two-year um, deadline. What I will tell you, though, is um, having been a former Casey, um, having worked for Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative, um, I, I've already drank the Kool-Aid when it comes to Philip First, and um, am, am absolutely a big supporter of it. And because I think it does right by kids in our system of care. And so, I, so I've had conversations with my staff. We have um, had Rob Post from the, the Court Improvement Program uh, invited into a meeting that we had where Jim Forbes presented uh, the slide similar to the information that we presented, I think it was here in the last in the last meeting, to talk about kind of family first um, kind of globally and, 
and where we are. Um, so we have, I wanted to let you know that we have officially asked for the delay that has been in place by October 1st, I believe, and so we have, I have signed that letter saying we are asking for the delay. Um, my intention though is that we continue the planning efforts and that we really need to coordinate this with you and ensure that we're in alignment for what it is that we want to do as a state moving forward. And it's similar to, you know, taking out a bank loan, this is something we can certainly, you know, delay it two years but implement sooner um, if, we, if we want to go in that direction. So I do think we have some work to do. We have asked the Vermont Certified Public Managers Program to uh, use a cohort to do some additional studying of and uh, assistance with kind of analyzing the issue and maybe the costs. And I'd very much like to do that in partnership with you. What is the Vermont problem? The Vermont Certified Public Managers Program is offered through state government. Um, I'm a graduate myself, but it is a two-year program where um, leaders in the state government are uh, it's similar. I liken it to a master's in public administration without the degree, mm -hmm. um, but you do get a, uh, a national, uh, you know, you become nationally certified. But they have a team um, each year that works on an identified um, state issue, a state government issue, and so we've put forth a request to have a cohort um, addressing. The family first implementation. Is that something that is internal or do they, can they share with outside of state government? Oh, I think they could absolutely share it outside of state government. Cool. Yes. One other thing really quickly, we do, um, we work with um, Susan Riley as our consultant with Casey Family Programs. And it sounds like there's someone else on the phone today with Casey Family Programs as well. Um, she is available to us if we want her to come and to present data, Vermont data, using our AFCARS data. Um, but I'm, certain, I'm sure that it would be in, in, uh, in concert with the folks that we have today in terms of thinking about what are the resources that we have to bring to bear in Vermont on Family First. I think we definitely have plenty of opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I mean, this is for us to ask questions, but also in our head, it is what do we need to know and what is our role as the legislators so and how much now. do we. Okay. I'm going to call Nina now. Okay. So we'll call Nina now because she wanted to listen in and then oh, okay. she can stay on the line and do, oh, okay. yeah. do her testimony. tested it. Uh, let's try it again. Well, good afternoon. This is Nina Williams and Bang at NCSL. Good afternoon, Nina. It's uh, Representative Ann Pugh. How are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, and I understand you want to listen in to um, what uh, Amy Bradley and Tim Decker had to say before you yes, spoke. Yes, okay. yes. That would be great if possible. Okay. Um, you, you're going to be listening to them now. We'll try to be as quiet as we can be in terms of... That's okay. Of I'll put you on mute so, you don't, so I don't make any noise either. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. This is Amy Brady again, the Voices for Vermont's Children. I'm a policy associate. And I'm really going to defer almost all of my time to Tim Decker, who flew in here to talk to us today. I greatly appreciate his availability at the last minute and willingness to talk about Families First Prevention Act. I did want to just create a little bit of context, because at the last meeting, I had heard that there was some concern about, an understandable concern about the impact on our residential treatment programs. And what I've been hearing from advocates across the country and also from people in all the systems of care is that Families First is a perfect will, but it gives us the opportunity to reimagine our systems of care and there is some flexibility in it to take advantage of the pieces that work best for Vermont. And what we know is that residential treatment has an important place in the continuum of care. That some kids bounce from home to home and benefit from stable place to express their trauma and to gain new skills. And that Vermont currently has some gaps in our continuum of care. We are lacking intensive mental health placements for older female youth. We are lacking foster homes that can support people with sexualized behavior. 
We require better support for our foster homes so that they can accept the placements that require more intensive interventions. We need our residential homes to know that they are supported when a child with complex needs is stretching their capacity. And we need an alternative to Woodside. DCF staff should have the space in the day to do their best thinking and to offer their best work. When each piece of the continuum care is strengthened, it creates space for the others to do what they were intended to do. Residential care works best when it's serving the right kids at the right time, and when it has a robust system to support the kids and their family when they're not in the program. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Thank you so much, Amy, and it's, it's really great to be here. Um, I think you should have on your iPads uh, a copy of a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to follow it strictly, but I will in general, um, because I really want to be more responsive to what your um, questions, concerns, and, and thinking has been about what, what the opportunities are. So um, let me start out a little bit. It's been fascinating to be here today. And it's, I retired from Missouri State Government July 1st of 2018, and I haven't been in any legislative hearings in my own capital for over a year now. And um, I, I hate to say this, please don't repeat it to any of, your, any of my colleagues in Missouri, I kind of miss them. So um, <laughs> we had a really great working relationship with our budget committees and then we had a joint committee on child abuse and neglect, which this committee actually reminds me a lot of. And it gave us a chance to really have thoughtful conversations about um, the challenges in child welfare and then what the opportunities were and, and it was great to work with a group of legislators both senators and, and representatives that really studied the issues and were had decided not to do kind of reactive knee-jerk legislation and respond to the latest crisis of the day but had had really committed to understanding the complexities and it was great to have part legislative partners that understood the complexities and really worked with us as partners so I, I want to just applaud your efforts initially just to really dig into these really tough issues because these are, you know, the, the place where we often fall down is we, we get into believing that a child protection agency could actually protect and care for all of our children in the state, which we know that's not the case. It's not the way it was intended to be. We have families and communities, you know, raise children and, and um, government is there to step in when absolutely necessary and to provide critical supports to allow other people to do what they were intended to do, but then also when there were issues and problems, that it was if we just fixed the broken child welfare agency, um, it would, everything would be all right. And what I would say to that is, been there, done that, and didn't even get a t-shirt, it didn't work. Um, we have to think more systemically about some of the challenges in front of us. And I think Family First attempts to do that. I think at the same time, while we're thinking systemically, we have to make sure that everything we do makes sense on the ground. So when I became child welfare director in Missouri back in, Prior to that, I had been um, director of our juvenile justice agency for seven years, so over almost 12 years, I was director of one or more of those agencies. I had worked as a partner with the agency, but had not worked in it. So the first thing that I did was, I called it walk in your shoes, is I spent time in the field with our frontline practitioners. So 10 days initially, in Missouri we have um, large urban areas, suburban areas, rural, and then what I call isolated rural, where there's almost nothing, and I went everywhere. And it was kind of like undercover boss, somebody knew I was coming. And what actually broke my heart in those, in those experiences, um, one I saw amazing, as some of you have mentioned, some amazing work happening. What broke my heart is how we were falling short of what we were really intended to be. So a common question for, um, you know, you're driving in cars, I think you're, you're visiting, you're probably going from home to home, and sometimes a distance, sometimes not. Um, and you'd have those windshield conversations about like, how do you like your job? And the common response from our frontline practitioners was, it's not what I expected it to be. And I'd say, well, what's the next question, right? What is expected to be, right? Um, well, I, th I thought I would be helping people. So then we got into conversations about what is it we're doing that's not helping people? What is it that we're doing that is helping people? And the reality is, is we brought the National Child Welfare Workforce Institute in, which was a uh, we were selected as part of a federal program that did extensive study of our workforce. We talk a lot about workforce issues today. And the bottom line is our frontline practitioners were spending, I think I misstated this, so listen very carefully. Um, they were spending 9% of their time actually working directly with families that weren't paperwork related. So we talk about stress and turnover and those types of things. 
they had way too many families they were working with because we did not have an effective prevention continuum. So they were asking those folks to work on all kinds of different issues. Some families that really needed help and some that a prevention program would have been able to meet the need. Um, we also had, uh, there was a burnout scale we administered with our staff and um, the actual work with families, the, the concerning score would be 50 in this scale. The scores were about 44 in terms of the work with children and families. They understood they were signing up for tough work. Um, the workload, the caseload burden, the workload, the, the unrealistic expectations we had for them, their scores were in the mid-50s, which is a clinical concern where people should be like getting counseling. So we had to take a hard look at like how our system was set up, both in terms of um, are we serving the right families that really need us, and are we doing the work in the right way? And so when family first came along, you began to think about like what did we learn from that process that aligns well with family first? And just like you're doing, where does family first perhaps present some challenges? So one of the um, one of the children I visited, or one of the workers I spent time with um, in walking your shoes, we were visiting residential care programs. It was time to do the visits to the kids. And I still remember a young man that we met, one of the parties we met, a young man and a young woman who she had on a caseload, and we were talking about. And the young man had completed the program um, about a month and a half before this visit and was still there. And he was starting to get consequences. He was starting to, to act up again. He didn't really see anyone following up on his future. We had literally forgotten him there in that program. So when I think about Family First and the, um, the scrutiny around placement of children in congregate care or residential programs, he was past the time that he needed to be there for treatment. And you question whether he needed the treatment in the first place. I think he believed that he did. And I think that program had actually been helpful to him. Uh, first 10 years of my career as a social worker, I ran residential treatment programs, and I believe they have a value. Uh, I think they have a value for treatment purposes, and I think they have a value. The time limit for each kid should be different based on their treatment plan. What I experienced in that visit was the worker I was with did not know what the child's treatment plan was, and again, he completed the program and, and was frustrated because he didn't have a next step, was starting to act up, and the program was getting ready to recommend keeping so when we talk about family first, for, for instance, around residential care or congregate care, building in some additional oversight, one kind of third-party assessment, whether it's needed, regular, you know, some uh, court review of those placements, um, making sure our facilities meet certain standards. I think we could debate whether the standards fit or not, especially for small group homes, which I think you have a lot of those here. I'd probably be with you there in saying, how are we going to navigate that? We have to figure that one out. Um, a lot of ours were larger institutions, or maybe those PRTP standards make a little more sense. But the idea of really thinking about finding a way for every child possible to grow up uh, in a family, to have that permanency in a family, to be able to heal in a family, is something we're taking on. Uh, for us, it gave rise, our focus on reducing congregate care, for instance, gave rise to developing in home programs. So we had a program called Behavior Interventionists, where we would have someone sometimes in the home for six to eight hours helping manage the child's behavior. Um, it didn't cost much less than residential care. Sometimes it's a little bit more, but that child was in a family. And they were able to be supported in the family. A lot of people that were working in that program and still working in that program that's now spread to a number of communities in Missouri actually had worked in residential care. And they were doing residential care only in now. And so that helped us really be creative. So sometimes that kind of oversight, those checks and balances, can help us think, is there another way that we can make this work? Realizing that some kids, you're always going to be universal kids in the child welfare system that need residential programs. And that are going to need that type of intensive treatment. And sometimes we'll need it again for stabilization purposes and so forth, even after they move to Africa. So when we think about like what we're working toward, and I think about the core of family first being kind of anchored in uh, let's invest for the first time in prevention services prior to a child coming into custody agency. Title IV has never been available as a federal match for anything that occurred before a child was um, ordered by a judge into the system. Many have said that that really incentivized work as being in the system. And I can tell you that while I don't believe anybody makes money at that, some people say you're making money off our kids, the universe of kids you get money on is fairly small and you never get the full cost. So nobody's making money at that. 
But the reality is, is that we had many children, for instance, for behavioral issues, and there was no other care source other than child welfare. So they were in, in custody arrangements because they needed a certain service or support. Some of, sometimes they could have been provided in a home for a prevention service, like multisystemic therapy, which is on the list, for family first, functional family therapy, which is on the list, those kinds of interventions could have actually been affected and they wouldn't have had to make the most intrusive intervention on the plan. So the idea that we're going to think about investing in prevention and the federal government is prioritizing that, I think it's huge. Again, how it rolls out, we have a lot of control over um, assuring that children can be in a family if we think that's really important. That's absolutely necessary. And then we make sure that it's still necessary as it as it goes along. I think I, I think as a director, if I was still in Missouri as a director, I would welcome that oversight. I, we sometimes struggle to have that kind of oversight and then not have like even pushback from our providers saying, you know, leave us alone and all that. And that was kind of something we needed to do, right? And there's some some pretty sensible kind of checks and balances that are built into it, um, including making sure these are quality residential experiences. Again, we could kind of debate what that looks like. I'm not a fan of overwhelming standards, you know, overwhelming requirements for this program, some of which are really important and some of which are not as important as others. <laughs> to figure out like, what really matters and really focus on that. Um, obviously, the Act really prioritizes maybe aligning some of the transition programs more to what we know about the development of, of adolescents and young adults. I, my children are in their 30s, so I know what it's like to, I have some who back in my home at age 24, so I know, uh, maybe I'll say I'm not going to have you raise your hands, but um, that happens. So we know that extending the age limits on some of the JP related programs and so forth obviously makes sense. Um, and just making sure that the efforts that we're implementing with our families are, are really well planned. Um, and I think the Family First Act begins to really address that. I think the other um, financial related, I know people will do analysis on this, but the one thing that some don't think about in terms of the financing mechanism is. 4E funding, because it's based on AFD, old AFTC standards, is a very limited, you're going to have fewer and fewer families qualify for, for any type of 4E match every year. You're going to keep having fewer and fewer families qualify. Um, the uh, federal match for the prevention services, if there's things you can do without custody that could be, um, the, uh, certainly would be the evidence-based programs that are on the list as well as new ones that might need to be developed. Um, there's no um, there's no income limits test on those funds. So that's any child that you identify as being a candidate for foster care. So a lot will get down to how the agency administratively defines um, candidacy for foster care. And I would like to states where they're defining that very some are going like we're gonna make it like every child that is living in this certain community or every child before we get a hotline call or something. That's a pretty wide net, you know, to think about and to think about then matching those 50% of those services. But it also keeps the, it open to figure out where it's most needed because you're not required to necessarily provide the service, but it just opens it up for the federal match. Others are going with a much more narrow definition of imminent risk um, of, of coming into custody. So how you cast that net, some will include children with behavioral issues and so forth so that they can there are some pretty good um, evidence-based in-home programs, like I mentioned, multi-systemic therapy, for instance, is one of them. Um, home builders, if it's a parent skill-based need, but there's just not enough structure and basic needs aren't getting met in the home. So there's some pretty good programs. Uh, we spent in Missouri $11 million on home builders, and 87% um, of the families we served through home builders and children, we did not get a subsequent referral, and they did not come into custody for at least 12 months after the programmatic intervention. And those were children that were imminent risk if something doesn't happen, we're moving them from home. So there are some programs that are really proven and can actually keep children safe and make sure they're well cared for without custodial intervention. So that you can invest your caseworker resources and your kind of in custody resources on the families that need it most. And indeed, that's of intervention. Um, that's probably going to be your best way long term to bring your caseloads down so that the social workers can really do the kind of quality work that they need to be doing with their families. So um, my, what I always encourage people to do, I just try to think about this through the lens of um, like what, what I would be doing and what I would be recommending to my legislature if, if I was sitting with them right now, if we were in Missouri right now. And I would say think about it systemically, think about the things we've always wanted to do anyway 
uh, and think about how family first can support that. And then let's really try to manage and navigate the rest of it. So part of it is, it's not going to work well if the system, I think in concert with the legislature, with the judiciary, if you have a really strong vision for what your ideal system looks like, and you know where you want to go, and you kind of understand the values that are driving your decisions, um, then I think family first is, can be more of an opportunity because you can figure out what parts of the law actually advance you towards your vision, advance you towards your ideal system, and you can figure out, like, we got down to really concrete decisions about what is it we're already doing that's working well that we can do more of, what's not working as well that we can do less of, and then what new things do we need to start doing. You can really have those kind of conversations if you have a vision and kind of a, a picture of what you would really want the system to be. To be the rest of it, the decisions become clearer after that, and it's not in the fault of so many. There's been many federal acts that have tried to improve the system. Almost all of them have made some improvement. Most of them have fallen short, and none of them have been silver bullet. Um, but where they go better is when we see them as part of a larger advancement of a vision for the kind of system we want to have for our kids and families. And so I think if you have that. I think the other thing I would speak to you for a minute, and without getting into too many particulars about the law, I'm going to manage my time well, is that what gets lost in some of this, you've talked a lot today about trauma. If I was like a media specialist, I'd have been counting the number of times that word, or some synonym that word was mentioned. We talk about it all the time. I can tell you one of the things beyond the walk in your shoes is when I was director, I committed to meet, meeting four weekends a year with our older youth for an entire weekend at a Jeff City Hotel where we would use them. They would become a policy group for me and a policy advisor, but we also had dinner together and all that. So there are tons of stories that long term relationships with you know, people that I still see. I remember Senator Sears and I were talking about seeing kids later. You were Senator Sears, sorry about the Senator. <laughs> seeing kids, you know, many years later. But I, I <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, well, you know, I'm going to just promote you right now. So you're back, you're back. Thank you. Uh, we were talking about seeing kids later, you know, years later, and the connections that are built when we, when we really do meaningful kind of work with kids. Um, but when I was hearing kids' stories, I still never forget one young, young person, young lady who said, you know, I, my mom was using drugs, she had different men in the house, so I know that the phone wasn't safe, but we really didn't have a lot of work to try to like, make it safer, you know, to work those issues, but they did come in really from my home, and in her view, it was like the SWAT team coming in, and she had a pack her belongings really quickly, and she didn't get to say goodbye to her mom, or even see you later to her mom, she was moved to a different community, was isolated from her school. We know that when we're in interviewing around safety, we should try to keep as many other things as stable, even if it's what the kid has for breakfast the next day, or the friendships that are important to them, or the activities that are important to them, or the hopes and dreams that they're working for. If we can keep more of that stable, we can reduce the trauma and actually not interrupt their path of well-being. So we know that from our, our research. But in this case, we removed her, and she said, it happened all at once, I was in shock. And um, you guys did what you're supposed to do. You took me to the doctor, you, you got me seen, and the doctor's like, well, she's a little, she looks a little sad, a little depressed, so we need to get her to see the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist says, well, she's suffering from depression, and what she's having is mood swings. She might be bipolar, and she's got all this going on. And she said, I was on medication, I was going to therapy, and I've been in therapy ever since. And I asked her, I said, well, what, like, I'm talking to like legislators and other people, and like, I'm kind of in charge of the system, at least kind of in charge, and a lot of people don't want to say about it. What would you want me to say to people about your experience? And can I share your story? She gave me a question to share. And she said, I want you to tell people that I was sad and in shock, I wasn't sick. And you stopped treating me like I was sick. And I heard that two things I heard from foster kids over and over again. One is you see us as wounded and inherently damaged. You don't even want people to know we're in foster care because it's a stigma. Even if I'm, I know older professionals that are foster care, they don't tell people because they're thinking, God, this person's really smart and really good, but when are they going to come apart? When is this all going to come undone? So they don't like a stigma. They don't like being seen as somebody that needs to be fixed, which is the nor does the trauma informed work is thinking about what happened and how we manage that versus what's wrong with you. And they actually don't, they feel like they're treated like a commodity that is moved from place to place without thought about the consequences for them. I had one young lady who her and her girlfriend, she had finally been in placement for two years, and she was 17, she was gonna be able to stay in her system 21 if she wanted to. And her and her couple, her and her friend went out, had a night out, drank a couple beers, had a fender bender accident. Nobody was legally drunk. The foster family had 
have things worked out, nobody was going to be charged, etc. Our first response in our system was when they, they heard about this on Monday, was you're going to move by Friday. Where am I going to move to? We don't know. We'll find you a place. I almost guarantee you that was going to be, she was 17 years old, that was going to be a residential program somewhere. And again, I think residential is very valuable for the kids that absolutely need it. But that was how she felt like we were, and she said, I'm going to run away. I'm going to ask the judge to release me from the system if you do this. Because I, have, I know this family's not going to be done with, but I have been here for two years. And quite frankly, she was involved in behavior that many of our adolescents are involved in. And we don't, my son gave me a run for my money. I never thought about him living well. Probably a time to that one living in their home, but but um, but I did. That wasn't our first response. Was you need to live someplace else? It was hey, you made a mistake. Let's learn from it. All the research on that was brain development tells us that that kids are in a critical phase of brain development in their adolescence, almost equal and probably equal to zero to three. It's just different part of the brain being wired. It's exactly a function, and they're thinking about the consequences of their actions. Um, emotional regulation and relational skills are all that part of the brain that's very active. So how do you learn to make good decisions? You make some mistakes, you have people around you, whether it's in a residential program and mentors you care about or a family um, or uh, a teacher at school that helps you work through how to learn from that mistake and hopefully not repeat it. And our kids, we talked about normalcy earlier, there were many cases where they did get to do that. So we talk about reasonable fruit parenting, we talk about having kids and families, um, if at all possible, only in residential or congregate care if they have some need treatment, supporting their long-term um, transition to adulthood through extending the extent of JFE services, really prioritizing kinship care, because we know from research that that's typically more stable and less traumatizing to the child. All of those things are very powerful. The nuances of some of the details get a little more complicated. The great news is they're still developing some of the details so we can have a you kind of have a hand in that and the plan that you and your agency are going to be submit to the federal government. When you get to that point, I completely support delaying to have more time to plan. I think Missouri's in, in the first way, but we had actually been working on it for a pretty long time, some of those same themes, and, and it's just a different situation there. So different states will have to make the best decision, but go in with a vision and a plan and think about how it can be an opportunity. And I think you can manage the complications with it. I, I really do. And I'm thinking if I was still running the system, how worried would I be about this? I'd be mostly excited. I definitely would be worried about certain aspects of it. And I'd think about how to kind of fill those gaps. But the trauma informed aspects of it, the family focus, the kinship focus, um, it, it takes you beyond the name of family first. It is a, you always name these things really fancy things, and they never live exactly up to the name. But, but I think those are some real opportunities for you to move some things forward that I know from hearing you talk today you really care about. Um, and I think the Annie Casey Foundation, just like Casey County programs, just to clarify, Annie Casey's in Baltimore, um, based in Baltimore, Casey County program in Seattle. Um, we are working together on Family First. Um, Casey County program is focused exclusively on child welfare. Annie Casey also works on juvenile justice, income sufficiency. We do the kids' count report every year. But I think we stand ready to engage with you in whatever way makes sense with your agency, with the legislature. Um, to help you navigate some of these challenging decisions and actually to advocate for you in some cases for when we hear from multiple states that like a certain thing is an issue. For instance, there's not enough evidence-based practices on the list. And a lot of them are really insufficient for like some of the programs I know where we work. So the federal government's now issued guidance for interim payments for states can do their own study of programs and can actually support those programs through Family First Match. Until the federal government gets a chance to, the courthouse gets a chance to review that program with the promise that no money will be recouped if they don't make the clearinghouse, and you can still do them for another quarter even after they're found to not make the clearinghouse. So it is a chance to really take some programs you really care about to make work and study them and actually help make them better and kind of get them to the clearinghouse with no financial risk whatsoever. Probably the only risk is that if you get a good program and everybody loves it and that kind of goes away, that's always a challenge for legislatures to figure out how to address that. But I do see them responding to places where there's challenges. I think they're responding around some of the kind of care provisions where there's challenges. So I think this could be kind of a, there can be a give and take in this, but I think, again, it's, it has to be guided by a vision. And ultimately, and Amy talked about this other stuff, about it, if we really focus on the needs of the children, I can tell you, the system I took over Missouri, we said we were child focused, we were not. We actually thought that when we removed a kid that we had saved that child when the kids would tell us that was the worst night of their life. 
because even though they were, didn't feel safe where they were, they weren't being well cared for, they didn't know what was going so it was very difficult. We were so disconnected from the voice of the kids. So now we have processing, now we hear from the young people and have them shape their own plans so that they're actually involved, which is very trauma informed. So when you kind of go down those pathways and those themes and family first, there are tremendous opportunities. And again, we'll help you navigate the details. Others will be there to help you navigate the details. So I have a family first, I absolutely am. Are the parts I worry about? Yes. Do I care about the thing residential care is important? Yes. I would be like disowning the whole part of my life if I didn't, where I saw kids transform their lives. But I also was had a chance to build really effective programs, and all of ours are not. So I know what my state I can always do for that. So I think at that point, you've got my PowerPoint, you're gonna have tons of details. I'm assuming the details you've got before, there's even stories in the PowerPoint today to get a chance to tell you, but I'm not gonna speak to today, so I'm gonna be respectful of that. Any questions for me before I um, give what to the others? Um, I, I have a bunch, I don't know if other people do as well. In the beginning of your testimony, you talked about or what I understood you to say is that states can define imminent risk. So are they doing it by rulemaking, or is the legislature defining it for the purposes of this? And um, with all due respect, I don't consider imminent risk prevention. Yeah. I'm sorry, I mean prevention well, is that families aren't in there yeah. in the first place. And yeah. so... There is two of you, because the, and you'll see in my PowerPoint actually, is that Family first is not primary prevention. It's 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 kids at the kind of doorstep of child welfare, right? So by no definition, there's even newer that they're always changing the words of these things, right? So, um, but what I learned, the world I came up in is you know primary, <coughs> secondary, tertiary, etc. With those kinds of terms, and it is not primary prevention at all. Um, what states are doing, part of the state plan has to be defining candidacy. So candidacy it has to be approved by the federal government. It's being addressed in a variety of ways. In some cases, the agencies are defining it in their plan they submit that they put together. Other cases, legislatures are defining it. So what is um, this plan that they are submitting? Is this in response to the Families First legislation, or is this the regular plan? No, this is uh, this is a response to, well, I think what they've done, um, I think our colleagues from the agency can, can clarify this. I think what they've done is they, they're going to roll it in eventually to their 40 plans, but they actually have to submit a family first plan and how they're going to comply. And they have to get specific things like candidacy approved and those types of things. And some states are trying to kind of innovate with things that are a little outside the box. So, so, in the interim, are, are, um, are we to look to the Title 4A plan, which I don't know really is necessarily shared with the legislature? So, what you would have now would be your. your Title IV plan that typically is done every what, four or five years, and then you have your um, annual reports that are attached to that. So that would be the plan from the federal perspective that would guide your your use of forty dollars. Um, and, and, and I think the challenge for us, and I'm looking to the appropriations members, uh, is um, <clears throat> uh, I believe that we do a bunch of our funding through global commitment, right? And then not and not for it, but you do other things with for it. I'm not quite sure what it is, mm. right? That's right? Yeah, it's, it, and I'll get confused with those. So yeah. global commitment and what is that fund and this one. Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, they actually were not the same time. <laughs> but the, you know, we're doing fiscal and the administration to hours to figure out what this means and what that means, and then you have to debate that with the centers for medical. CNS. Yeah, so you're covering your Medicaid funding and everything. Yeah, so it's never, but luckily, Senator Westman handles the DCF budget for the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, and he probably can handle that. Yeah, so that is a good question. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. Residential treatment programs for substance abuse, worldwide like moms and babies, being the same program. Even if you don't have a plan in, states could have accessed those October 1, 2018, if you had them. So, match for those programs. So, there are some things you could do without a plan, but most states going to require a plan. Um, but I think there are the fiscal implications are going to be things like what do you allocate for prevention services? Because you do have to commit a 50% match and you have to have, main, have a maintenance of effort based on 2014. And so, there are some implications, depending on how your budget process works or where you want to push your money, 
Um, and some legislatures are deciding to put money into, for instance, assisting West Central programs in, in achieving your TV Yeah. I, well, sorry. I, I look at that, yeah, no, I look I, that as, a, as a, a challenge. It um, is a challenge, yes. Is that it seems to be medicalizing the presidential treatment. It, it is based more on a, more on a, the kind of nursing staff and all that. So, um, but some states are putting money into helping their providers kind of meet those standards or reorient themselves. Some are putting more money into kinship, supporting kinship supports because they know there's a strong emphasis on this, you know, in, in this law, kinship navigators and stuff. So there are things you can do through the budget process that are very philosophically aligned with this and would certainly aid the effort. Um, but yes, it, eventually your state will have to submit a plan and then we'll have to say this is our go by date and they'll have to decide either add with what they submit and the federal government approves or in conjunction with you or through you how they're going to find candidacy. Because it does have implications for even though you might be asked to fund, you know, if you think about it. Um, and there's wisdom to going broader and there's wisdom to going narrower, quite frankly, which depends on, and I think you can change your definition, you know, through your plans, subsequent plans, you know, as you move forward. So it's not, you don't have to exactly, I think we're expected to kind of learn a little bit from this. But what it does, when you have more things that might fall on the prevention side, you are going to get the 50% match, and you are going to get it on your whole population versus just the segment that's already qualified. So there is an advantage to spending more money on the front end than once children in custody, in terms of your federal match. We spent a lot of time today talking about adolescents, which is fine. But Vermont, I'm sure every state has a problem with toddlers who are born to addicted parents, born parents, who are then incapable of taking care of their child. And I know many of my friends who now have gray hair who are taking care of their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, um, it's just kinship care and not the state involved. In some cases, the state is involved. In some of those cases, you know, parents are spending their retirement, the grandparents yeah. are. Um, and these, is there any place in here in this family's first initiative that could, that could deal with that problem? I mean, the assumption is maybe the parents will get better um, and be able to, you know, to take care of their child, but right now the yeah. number one priority is getting high. Yeah. I think there's there's three places I can think of right off the top of my head. I'm sure I won't capture them completely, so I reserve the right to submit additional ideas. Um, one is the, the residential substance abuse treatment is certainly has been an effective option in some cases for moms with their babies, for instance. So that's an option that they weren't helping pay for before and now they could. Now the problem is there aren't many of those programs that exist. The, I think eventually you're going to find that you already have some on the list in the home visiting realm. You're going to see a lot of, there's a lot of evidence-based home visiting programs. I think parents and teachers is there now their family partnership that are very, especially our family partnership, are very focused on those issues that could be an intervention that you could utilize. I think the kinship navigator programs that could help folks like you're discussing, the grandparents and so forth, get the resources they need could be very helpful in providing supports for families where like relative and kin are actually, you know, raising the baby. Um, maybe while mom or, and dad are getting some sort of treatment and maybe more permanently. Um, so I think there's some great opportunities there. Uh, I know in some cases states will, of course, will still choose to bring those children into custody, which then, I know in Missouri, we provide foster care parent, foster care payments to um, grandparents raising their children. Yeah, so, many of the people I'm talking yeah. about don't want to involve the state. They yeah. are, they are informal arrangements with their child. Yes. But, but, their child to take care of their grandchild. Yes. Um, in some cases, they go through the probate court system. Right. Further, further complicates. Uh, complicates things for probate judges who really aren't. Yeah. You know. yeah. yeah, I think the, the best options there are going to be the, the if it, you could include, you could include the families you're talking about in your candidacy definition, which would allow the prevention of the but the discussion with prevention with the chair. And, and truly, that is you're trying to prevent the child yeah. from yeah. further difficulty. So I'd include them in your candidacy definition would be one thought. Um, and then, then your kinship navigator programs could certainly be a support to them. 
Um, again, you're going to have to, and maybe if you construct them in a way where the model is one that doesn't build, include a lot of coercion and build additional, mis you know, a lot of folks have mistrust of the government, don't want them involved. So I know we we're always trying to navigate that and have more family focused models that could build relationships so people weren't so hesitant to ask for help. And so I think how, how the agency then constructs those programs, and especially how you manage from candidacy to referral. You know, some will say like direct referral to the program and the state won't touch the case at all. Well, that's possible. Some will have a light touch, check it out and hand it off quickly. Some may choose to stay involved. But getting your candidacy definition clear and then your levels of engagement from your agency clear would be really helpful um, on this. Because there are even some of the engagement work, you can build some of that under your administrative costs for like some of the casework and stuff that's needed. You gotta decide how much you want your caseworkers involved in the cases that that the senator was talking about. Um, because that may not be wise. I, I would start to view them, if we get involved where we don't really need to initially, it often became a stepping stone to deeper involvement that may or may not be necessary. Um, but some of these cases have some risk attached to them where you want to have one on. And, uh, and figure out how you figure that out, that's work the agency's going to have to do to make this work. I think that's where some of the most substantial decisions will be candidacy, referral processes, who's handling those cases, at what point they might referral for formal custody, those are going to be some of the toughest decisions. And those for the most part are agency decisions. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, yes. And you're not suggesting that they be no. all decisions. No, I'm not suggesting at all. Those, those get into the, how the casework is managed and all that, and, and uh, to me, the, those are going to be agency so, decisions. So how do you see, what recommendations do you have for legislative input or no input or oversight or whatever? So I have a couple of suggestions. I think one is you definitely have to touch this through your budgeting process. And and if you believe in like prioritizing prevention, you may want to prioritize prevention in your budgeting process. You may find you want to provide additional supports for things like supporting your programs and navigating the PRTP kind of designations. You may decide sorry, sorry, you want to. Could you explain that? Yeah. So, you know, your programs are already accredited, like through COA and, and the Joint Commission and things. That they have a really easy path to this. They generally already have to meet all those requirements. <coughs> programs are going to have a harder time. are going to be your smaller programs. And I understand most of your programs are smaller programs. Right. So, most of our programs are a whole lot yeah. larger than um, foster care yeah. is, that is allowed under this. I mean, yeah. we have folks that yeah. what are under. Well, yeah. yeah, so so they may need some help me to navigate. I know it's an additional advisor coming on like your TP status, but in just consultation and support and navigating those requirements. And maybe there are some options here for even even co-ops or something. I just think about how could those small programs pull resources together to have the kind of support they need without everybody having to do it themselves. So if there's a way to support those agencies. Um, I would also, some states are choosing to think about how they research and, and develop evidence for programs. We all of us have like these programs we know really work, but then maybe you're never going to get on that list without a lot of help. And that's the tragedy in some of this. If you've got some of these programs that have been around for a long time, they're on that list. I mean, the list so far is some great programs, but it's disappointing because it doesn't represent the universe of things that we know work. So really supporting programs, getting to that level so we can actually then claim the money on those Is programs. Home Builders on them? I looked at the list, I didn't see Home Builders. Home Builders is not on the The rumor is it's currently under review. And I can't imagine it won't be on the list, it has really strong evidence. So, you know, they get some low hanging fruit, I think, in the initial list. Right now, there's no kinship navigator program on the list. The two programs they looked at don't have enough evidence yet, so they're looking at like two more now. So there's some real challenges on that, but you may have to provide some support at the state level with your programs and agencies to do that. I think that's the thing. The other items you just have to decide how far you want to get involved. Like if you, um, there's certainly your even candidacy is a question of the agency could determine, submit it in a plan and get it approved. You can say you want to have a voice in that. Um, you know, I think those are just things you got to think about depending on the nature of your working relationships and how far you want to go. What do you mean when you say have a voice and make a decision about whether or not to have a voice in candidacy? Well, so you, I mean, I, I never served as a representative or senator, but, but I feel like I have because I spent a lot of time 
Um, we had one time when our foster youth actually um, held a hearing of legislators, and they got to actually be in the seats asking legislators questions. So I think I should do that sometime. It's fine. Um, but I think one way you do that is by having your agency communicate with you about what they're thinking and um, have these kind of conversations. So if you have any concerns about it, you get a chance to voice those, and then you can decide how involved you want to be from that. So I think I would use hearings and things like that as a way of just keeping yourself in the conversation. Um, and, and talk to your advocates, I'm sure your advocates are going to have thoughts about this. So, and, and really make sure, just from an oversight standpoint, that your agency is involved in a lot of partners in this. Because there are lots of questions about who should be involved, who should we hear from. And so you almost never hear from the birth families. And the youth have a voice, but often in a limited way, like share your story with us, let us reach conclusions about it. So I think how you, you can use the work that you do to make sure people are really engaged in the process and just ask your agency questions about who are you involved in and how and make sure it's meaningful. Because this is clearly, there's no way the legislation of the agency can accomplish this alone. There's another big message in this is that we're going to need the whole community to step up, the whole state to step up to take responsibility for the safety and proper care of children. It can't just be an agency responsibility. So the more we man we've got to manage differently. We've got to think about collaboration. We've got to think about um, even leadership occurring throughout the system. You have programs proposed to you today that might be worth looking at. So, uh, and processes, you know, today. So, I think you can play a major role in that. I know if I was still in Missouri, I'd be getting a lot of questions about this, and they would trust my answers, and, and, and really get involved to the, to the extent that they thought they needed to. You know, which I think is generally a good approach, you know, with most things. Any, probably I've taken too much time, but that's one of your responses. But this is all about it's kind of a big question but you you mentioned that um, we should look at parts of the law that will advance our system or vision and I want, you know that I mean it sounds like it's a huge consideration in terms of what we prioritize and I don't know if you have any familiarity with the Vermont system but I'm wondering if you know, off the bat, you have one or two, like take a look at this aspect. Something that's <coughs> like low hanging fruit that you really think could move the lever significantly, that we should really look at it and consider within that whole kind of body of new legislation. It's kind of a tough question, but. Yeah, and, and it's a tough one because I don't feel like I. You I, know the Vermont system. Yeah, I don't feel like I know the okay. Vermont system well enough. Um, I can tell you what I'd be looking at. Missouri and, yeah. and it would really be our, Missouri's a state that, I mean I would look at your data because Missouri's a state for instance that has 8.9 children per thousand in foster care and our numbers have been growing for a number of years where the national average has been like 5.8, 5.9. So I would be really trying to focus on prevention there because we were getting, we were getting a lot of families because there was just no other option to support their needs including a lot of like, behavioral health concerns and so forth. So I would be really all about, I mean, prevention would be huge for me. Um, you know, kinship, the emphasis on kinship and family-based placements, I think, would be huge. I think about Missouri now, we'd be trying to manage the hunger care aspects of it and, and trying to use it a little bit. Um, you know, Senator Sears and I were talking about this. Our juvenile justice programs are really good in Missouri. We've got to go on Harvard work and all that, so people from all over this. Our treatment programs actually, in on the contract side for child welfare aren't near as good. I think probably be using it to try to focus on the quality of those, that programming. But that's just the nature of cost half of quality programming. If I was looking at our just edge, I wouldn't be focused on that at all. I'd be trying to meet the requirements for navigation. But I really would encourage you to look at your data because that's going to tell you a lot, actually. I don't know what your hunger care rates are here. Ours were about 12%. We've already gone down from 18%, so but we want to get them to five or below. It's always my goal. So the kids were sometimes there too long, you know, or as the first placement when it was just a matter of not. So for instance, if you really invest in family finding, for instance, on the front end, and you get that first placement with relative or kin, with support on the trauma of removal, that was always my dream, and navigate some of that, then you probably don't even have kids acting out as much, but they look like they need psychotropics and counseling. And so I really focus on prevention, and then I always thought I would focus on, or if I had more time, on before removal and right afterwards. I think that sets the trajectory for the entire case. 
and I have a really robust, in fact, we had a proposal for an in-home intervention around just separation time, where every child separated would have a home visitor come and work with the foster parents and the grandparents around how they could help the child navigate the separation and think through things like how can we, what can we keep normal, how can we, so I'm just making choices about what time they go to bed and keep them, if there are routines or we establish things on. We almost got that funded actually in our state legislature. And I thought it would have saved us a lot of money down the road in the trajectories of kids winding up years in counseling and getting all the money to spend on all that. Yeah, so. Thank you. Thank it's you been a pleasure, and I'll be happy to come back. Came back on short notice this time, so. And now that I've seen the beauty of your state, I think I told my wife, we've got to get back here, so. Where she is. Wow.
Some states have established foster care provision services programs. Uh, other states have um, put in legislation um, um, information or um, some guidance around the implementation process. Some states have required strategic planning around prevention. Uh, several states have required the development of task forces or work groups to handle planning and implementation. States have also dealt with physical issues uh, in the legislation. And this is a screenshot of some of the, these are actually some examples from our Wednesday database. Slide nine, I pulled up a few examples uh, just to walk through so you'll get an idea of how, uh, you know, how involved legislators may be. In 2018, uh, Colorado actually enacted legislation that required an analysis and cost projection to determine the impact of family first on the state. They also require that each county perform an analysis of their in-home and out-of-home placements, and they require the creation of a child welfare task force uh, to make sure that they, you know, that they were in, in alignment with family first. In 2019, Colorado lawmakers required the creation of a foster care prevention and justice program. Uh, the law also has some requirements around the assessment of each child placed in a QRTP. And that that uh, evidence must periodically be submitted to the courts, who have some oversight, you know, responsibility as a federal legislation. Slide ten. Um, Kansas passed legislation creating again around the child's ongoing assessment of skills and needs. That that must be done uh, to support the child's placement in the QRTP. Maryland legislation also addressed the juvenile court role in the QRTP. Uh, requirement. Again, the juvenile courts uh, are required to review the assessment on a, on a specific time frame. And some of the states dealt with that in statute, such as Maryland. Slide 11. Um, Montana and Texas law require prevention and early intervention strategic plan be created. Uh, Montana also required an inventory of existing prevention programs. And Texas required the identification of a network of service providers. Now these are just a few examples of the legislation we're tracking. We do update it regularly. Um, we just updated again last week. Um, we keep the legislation on there that's still pending or perhaps fail. And again, um, you can easily go to our website, provide a summary and link to the legislation. And we'll be glad to get you more information on any of the bills, you know, the legislators, and um, forward any of the quest any questions you might have around the legislation. But again, we think question task forces, um, states are indeed looking at um, definitions of imminent risk of candidacy. And one of the things we want to do is prepare a list of that because it seems um, you know of great interest and would be of use to legislators. So when, when we do that we'd like to forward that one to you. Um, and then again looking at uh, prevention strategic prevention plans and also foster care program um, and a variety of other pieces as well um, uh, that might be of interest to you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, um, just I want to, I think if you are doing any compiling on like one sheet of definitions and things like that, that would be very helpful. Okay, great. I will write that down. Um, 
we did ask you whether or not the state was taking the congregate care delay. Most did not know that um, at that time. Again, the meeting was in August. Um, but some did know and knew that the state was moving forward. In other words, that they were going to meet the October 1, 2019 um, implementation. Uh, and others uh, knew that the state was going to delay and take the, the two year up, up to the two year delay. On slide 20, one of the questions we asked, um, because it seemed like this is something states would want to do when assessing family first and how it would impact their state. Um, and we asked, and most of the respondents said, yes, their states have, for example, assessed the number of available foster homes. Uh, they assessed the number of children in family foster care as well as the number of children in congregate care. And, uh, and, and uh, they knew that the state had addressed other child welfare related programs. And then, again, we did this in the community just to get a sense of um, what legislative needs might be to help us craft the program to meet their needs. Uh, and also get a sense of sort of a call on what legislators knew and the kind of information they getting out there and what they're concerned about. So, um, Nina, in identifying those four questions, are those <clears throat> questions or assessments that NCL, NCSL and others think are important benchmarks for moving forward?
department the opportunity to comment as well. Um, and then if there are other things that you want us to make sure we put on that day, we will, but that's what we'll start there.